It probably shouldn't be a surprise that in a very informal poll of nth review subscribers, the most recognizable horror video game franchise was, far and away, Capcom's Resident Evil series. Debuting in 1996, the viral zombie thriller of Raccoon City would spawn not just an extensive series of games that continually reinvented themselves, but animated films and Paul W.S. Anderson's cornball movies. But between Resident Evil's cloud and the weeds of gaming horror like Slender Man, Five Nights at Freddy's, Dead Space, Outlast, Amnesia, or even Alone in the Dark, the French series that inspired Resident Evil to begin with, you get the slower, more psychological horror of Konami's Silent Hill, and then, well, then there's System Shock. I was introduced to the Boston-built horror series as a kid in 1994, when I caught its opening cinematic being played in a loop on a tiny TV at my local Babbage's, right in the smack dab middle of Omaha, Nebraska, of all places. The box art alone is a terrifying relic of mid-90s cyberpunk art, but I was far too young to be playing out the horror of Citadel Station. When the demo for its sequel was included in my PC Gamer subscription five years later, I was immediately sold on the series and its megalomaniacal villain, arguably the most incredible foe in all of video gaming, Shodan, an AI with delusions of goddesshood. While neither of the System Shock games was a commercial hit, they scored well and it was clear that they were ahead of their time. Not only did the series develop a cult following by helping to develop the immersive sim and the cyberpunk shooter, serving as the spiritual predecessor to Thief, Deus Ex, and Bioshock, it would go on to influence the industry at large in largely unseen ways. To understand the System Shock series is to understand the design, mechanics, and structure of so many other modern games as well. So what is System Shock, and why should we be paying attention to its legacy? Today, we jack in and find out. It may not be the first, but it is the nth review, number 15, for the System Shock series. Brought to you by my patrons at patreon.com slash the nth review. In my talons, I shape clay, crafting life forms as I please. My mind and my body are changing, but they know it's me. They just can't prove it. What is a thought compared to a mind? Get back to Althea and the others and get out of here. I'm changing. My head is full of wonderful ideas and experiments. And now they seek to destroy me. System Shock made its way to shelves in late 1994 as the final collaboration between publisher Origin and developer Looking Glass. Origin, the Austin, Texas-based game developer and later floppy disk shipper, founded by Ultima creator Richard Lord British Garriott, was known for its science fiction and fantasy computer games including Ultima, Crusader, Bioforge, and the iconic space combat series and FMV pioneer Wing Commander. In 1990, Origin employee Paul Neurath left to co-found Blue Sky Productions and work on Underworld, a game that he began to design while at Origin, considered by most to be the first immersive sim. Along the way, Blue Sky recruited Doug Church to serve as the game's programmer. When New Wrath showed the proto-immersive sim Dungeon Crawler to Origin producer Warren Spector at CES the following year, it made sense that New Wrath's former employer would sign up as their publisher, while also lending them the popular Ultima IP to build the game around. The Ultima Underworld games enjoyed critical acclaim, but didn't make much money for Origin or Blue Sky. Between releases, Origin sold to Electronic Arts, expanding its slate of games through the mid and late 90s before being converted into a support house for Ultima Online and shut down in 2004. Over 25 years after Ultima Underworld, Neurath and his company Other Side would crowdfund a whole new Underworld game, but as the indie game they originally intended it to be. Of course, development on the second Ultima Underworld, accomplished in a mere nine months of exhausting crunch, robbed Blue Sky of their will to work underground. Rebranding as Looking Glass, they looked upward. It might be hard to believe these days, but Looking Glass faced a challenge not in what property they could adapt or what hit they could sequelize, but in creating an entirely new IP that they would own, with gameplay that had never been seen before. 
Church, New Wrath, Spectre, and designer Andrew Grossman brainstormed their next game based on one-minute gameplay scenarios that they dreamt up, based on their functionality their immersive sims had only teased so far. With Spectre as their publisher, Money Man, and the person who could effectively explain what Looking Glass was building to his bosses, they sold Origin on System Shock, a game in which a hacker fought to defeat a malevolent artificial intelligence in the dynamic environments of a space station orbiting Saturn. This would be directed by Church. As System Shock gained momentum, Looking Glass was looking to become its own publisher, similar to what Origin had done years earlier, and banked a lot of their resources on a self-published flight simulator called Flight Unlimited, designed by physicist Seamus Blackley. The game wound up being a success, but at the expense of development resources for System Shock. When it was released in September 1994, System Shock was an incredible technical achievement with perspective-correct 3D environments that other, more popular contemporaries like Doom and Star Wars Wars Dark Forces couldn't pull off. Nearly everything in the game was rendered in 3D in real time, except the enemies and half of the environmental props, years before Quake or the popularity of 3D acceleration hardware. Blackley even contributed his physics expertise to the game, allowing for dynamic reactions and player movement. Hoping to beat the holiday crowd, System Shock initially shipped on nine 1.44 megabyte floppy disks before shipping on a single CD-ROM that December. The differences were incredible. Players of the CD-ROM version could play at a higher 640x480 resolution if their computer could handle it, making the entire experience more intelligible. The cinematics were quadruple the resolution and clarity, and, most importantly, all of the emails you receive and logs you download came with voiceovers when they'd previously just been literature. This feature would set a standard for so many games to follow, and Spectre has even expressed regret at releasing a floppy disk version at all. In 2015, future port house Night Dive, who broke out with their reissue of System Shock 2 in 2013, released an enhanced edition of System Shock that not only worked on modern machines, but included some quality of life improvements as well. They improved it with the Source port version in 2018 that was built into their proprietary Kex engine, granting proper mouse look and 4K support. This is the version I played for this review. As tempting as it was to dive in and play the original 1994 versions, both of which came included and provided a lot of historical context. System Shock was critically acclaimed, but didn't make much money for Looking Glass or Origin, so Looking Glass went back to the well with a washed-out Hollywood screenwriter wannabe named Ken Levine, who would wind up under Doug Church's wing and ultimately craft the big ideas behind Thief the Dark Project. This is the point, if you haven't done so already, to go check out at least the first hour of my Thief series review, which will bring you up to date on what happened to Looking Glass before, during, and after Thief, leading up to their closure in 2000. Writer Levine and programmer colleagues Jonathan Che and Robert Fermier left the developer during a rough series of layoffs in 1997, forming Irrational Games. Their first big deal fell through, and they found themselves close to failing when New Wrath contacted them about building another game with the new Dark Engine they created for Thief to spread the cost across multiple games. Irrational's first game, Junction Point, was a System Shock-like game in everything but name because of the complex deal that Warren Spector put together that prevented either Looking Glass or Electronic Arts doing anything with the property unless both parties were on board. At this point, Spectre was long gone from Origin and working on his own game, which received its own nth review. But Looking Glass and Irrational went to EA with Junction Point, and, like Origin did eight years earlier, offered to publish Junction Point and grant them the System Shock license at the same time. And thus, System Shock 2 was born to a small group of both experienced and green developers in a 900 square foot office in Boston. While some engineers and programmers were still available at Looking Glass who had worked on the original game, nearly all of the creative and production leads above the line, so to speak, were fresh, granting the sequel a very different look, feel, and narrative than the first game. Working so closely with Looking Glass brought its own challenges, as either team could introduce bugs to the Dark Engine that would affect the other game, and neither had mature enough tools to get the most out of their limited resources. As I mentioned in the Thief series review for a chunk of both games' development, the Dark Project and System Shock 2 could be run from a single executable. System Shock 2 released in August 1999, eight months after Thief, and while it was critically acclaimed, it didn't make much money for EA, Looking Glass, or Irrational. Irrational worked on a batch of critical darlings before getting together with publisher 2K, getting purchased by 2K, getting rebranded as 2K Boston, and releasing Bioshock, a game that was critically acclaimed and 
Well, surprise made lots of freaking money. We'll circle back to this. Before we dive deep into these games, it might be clear from the footage used so far that you'll find fewer ways to experience the difference between the two System Shock games than in how they're presented. System Shock 2 is often noted as the entry point to the series for many fans due to its accessibility and cohesion and the whole not being a DOS game thing. But it looks and feels relatively conservative compared to the audiovisual abrasiveness of the first game. System Shock embraces nearly the entire color palette in a way I really enjoy, which is enhanced if you play the game like I did with a light source on it pretty much all times. It distinguishes each of Citadel Station's levels, makes enemies and items pop visually, and grants this terrifying outpost a vitality that's genuinely fun to look at, despite the fact that you are walking through a very busy massacre site level by level. Now I'm not saying Rovio, Zynga, or King learned from System Shock, but it's no surprise that mobile games like Angry Birds and Farmville capitalized on bright palettes to hook gamers. System Shock's visuals can seem garish and clown-like at times, but playing it, it was comforting that visually they erred on the side of being more in league with Jet Set Radio than System Shock 2 did, or even Night Dive's remake of this very game. Well, I mean, except for those new cyberspace features. Of course, this wouldn't be a review of the first System Shock without mentioning the freaky, psychedelic visuals when taking performance-enhancing cyber drugs. Well, <laughs> here you are. Citadel Station's final level on the detached bridge section, helmed by Shodan as she screams her way back to Earth in one last ditch attempt to destroy humanity, is a chilling section. The walls are swapped from their default trioptimum tones and replaced with moving, giger esque sprawl, and it's one of the first game's many good visual ideas. System Shock's aesthetics build both a terrifying world to survive and a kind of emotional reprieve when things get intense, and I enjoy it for that reason too. While Doug Church says they were a few months away from being able to put 3D enemies in this game, I'm glad they didn't, for reasons I'll get to shortly. In their place are a series of single-sided sprites who you have to assume are always facing you even if they potentially aren't. Unfortunately, while I appreciate the vibrancy and unique designs this allows for, they tend to blend together thanks to their low resolution, and in motion, they don't quite have enough frames to animate convincingly. This stands in pretty firm contrast with all of the technical achievements that this game makes elsewhere. On top of that, when I entered a space with a lot of sprites, like rooms loaded with barrels or corpses, it was almost nauseating to see them swim around your perspective. This isn't a big deal in a top-down contemporary like Dungeon Keeper, but in first person? Oh man. Finally, even if I kept my headlamp on as often as possible, I was really surprised at how the game handles light maps, including shadows and flickering lights and stuff. I was under the impression after studying the Dark Engine for Thief, Thief 2, and even System Shock 2 last year that the Dark Engine's use of modular light maps was a relatively new innovation with the cost of some pretty insane load times to load all of those light maps into RAM. It seems that whatever they built for System Shock was a prototype of that technology that probably used far lower resolution light maps less often. Of course, I don't know if load times were insane in 1994 or something because I had no way to emulate it and everything loads instantaneously in 2021. System Shock 2, however, is a different beast visually and it has its own mixture of technical trade-offs coming half a decade after the first game. The sequel's 1999 release came right as 3D gaming was really starting to take shape, but it was at a point still early on in the graphical fidelity S-curve that was the late 90s and early aughts. The Dark Engine allows System Shock 2 to have an entirely 3D environment, accomplishing all of those technical goals that were a bit too lofty for 1994 personal computers. The enemies were 3D, all the props and weapons and ammo were 3D, looking like stylistic versions of what they really should look like, rather than objects out of the Money for Nothing video. But still, while these are 3D assets and the Dark Engine allowed for scripted animations with some difficulty, they're not high poly 3D assets. The team made cutscenes in engine without the elaborate expense of fully CGI assets, but you then have to deal with lumpy low resolution characters in highly compressed cutscenes that had to fit on System Shock 2's single CD-ROM. While System Shock had cartoony, kinda glitchy characters, the characters and enemies of the sequel looked like they crawled right out of the uncanny valley, which actually probably worked in their favor. Faces are triangular and sometimes textures are just oddly scrunched up. 
There were higher resolution asset mods later on, but out of the box, this is how things were, and it's how I played it, as intended and designed. In an interview with PC Gamer, producer Jonathan Che explained that the Dark Engine presented a lot of problems when working with its primitive scripting tools. The problem is exacerbated in part, as Che explains, because they relied on motion capture to animate characters rather than animating them by hand. The low fidelity capture data required a lot of time to clean up and an entire second motion capture session, which seems quaint considering the asset requirement of modern games, to try and fix things when they weren't quite working. Marrying these primitive, dirty motion captures to low poly assets is a bit of a trip at times, producing characters that look like sock puppets, or upon death, rumpled antique dolls that don't have quite enough stuffing. A highlight to this approach, however, is the massive rumbler beast you encounter halfway through the game. They're a bit of a fight, but once they go down, they resemble someone in a giant foam alien suit falling dramatically for <laughs> a community theater production. Getting shot by cyberpunks? Don't let this happen to you! Introducing Rumbler Flakes! It's kind of ironic that after all the technological advancement between games, embracing the second game's look required an even bigger suspension of disbelief at times. I touched on the pre-rendered cutscenes, but the game does utilize that in-engine scripting to create in-game cinematics as well. These sequences don't happen very often because of the difficulty Irrational had getting them to work, but they are very effective. It turns out these difficulties also resulted in big changes to the game's ending, something we'll touch on later. But then there are the creative choices that Irrational made. The game is a lot darker. Everywhere all the time. This alone was a very stressful element for me, but it also lends to the game's muted, monochrome look, whether grays and black on the Von Braun, or browns and reds as you get into the Rickenbacker and the body of the many. It's better looking technically, but even with some colorful accents here and there, it's kind of boring to look at. Irrational not only ripped out the expanded color palette of the first game, which was a fair choice of course, but they also ripped out a lot of the lighting options as well. You can't turn on a headlamp or take drugs and change the feel of a scene, even if there are a few well-lit rooms. One of my favorite parts of System Shock 2's look is the graphic design. I lean toward enjoying the first game's art direction better, but I also acknowledge that it's pretty incoherent. System Shock embraces a very garish 80s neon cyberpunk look, something that I think Cyberpunk 2077 embraced and executed insanely well based on the footage I've seen. But System Shock 2 takes a step back and embraces a more muted and consistent 70s tone that would fit right in the visual neighborhood with Terran Trade Authority artwork or Saturn V or even 2001. The first game feels like a chaotic dystopian nightmare in progress, and the sequel feels like the dystopia is a settled issue. The graphic design embraces a very defined system, with Eurostyle used on everything from the UI to the ship's paneling. The second game's very intentional and specific look really engages the notion that, despite the fact that both games take place far from Earth, you truly are far from safety while orbiting the distant world of Tau Ceti V. You really are alone out here. One little complaint, the UI doesn't scale very well at higher resolutions. I was squinting at UI details in 1440p and it wasn't the greatest. Maybe they'll fix that with the enhanced edition. When it comes to audio, however, my opinion is flipped. While System Shock's abrasive visual stylings were kind of exciting, its music and sound effects carry on like an assault. Greg LaPiccolo's score is an unrelenting series of beeping and booping and blipping MIDI that does not ever seem to shift down a gear. It wasn't long before I turned it off entirely. The sound effects survived the mute because they were contextual. The calls and actions of enemies and actions in the environment also seem exaggerated to call attention to themselves, but when you hear these effects over and over it becomes irritating. There's this room in the first hospital level that has a malfunctioning door that keeps opening and closing and it is so fucking annoying. Sounds penetrate walls which helps because it's a horror game to keep you appraised on what's going on, but doesn't seem very realistic in a pair of games that kinda lean on realism. But enough bitching about all that, this synthesized voice is one of the coolest parts of the game. Cyborg conversion cancelled. Standard Station Restoration Procedures Online The music in System Shock 2, composed by audio director Eric Brocious, with assists by Ramin Jawadi, yes, 
that Ramin Jawadi. And Josh Randall isn't quite the assault that La Piccolo's score is, but it's still uh, a lot at times. With a full CD-ROM's worth of space ready from the get-go, Brocious could produce full-fidelity pre-processed tracks that are a bit smoother on the ears, which goes hand-in-hand -hand with its very aggressive and very late 90s EDM beats that crank way up when action is happening, and sometimes when it isn't. But the score also finds time to chill out and just be creepy, and that's a huge plus. The sound effects, thankfully, are more subtle, more helpful than stressful, and no doubt inspired by the game's more biological enemies versus the clangy robots and cyborgs you fight in the first game. It's incredibly intuitive to recognize what's around you from the various slithers and skitters and groans alone without the need to blast your ears out. Eric Brocious is also the audio genius who brought Shodan's chilling dialogue to life, provided by his wife Terry Brocious, whose work on the Thief series I absolutely appreciated. Hint, hint while he cameos as the voice of the game's various robots. I'm sure this is just what you were looking for. This also wouldn't be a System Shock review unless I mentioned that Eric and Terry Brocious, as well as Greg LaPiccolo, were all part of the Boston-based electronic band Tribe before diving into game development. There you go. Achievement unlocked. This is Edward Diego from Trioptimum. The charges against you are severe, but they could be dismissed. Sure. For this review, I'm going to do something different, and that is, like my review for the Alan Wake series, I'm going to spoil the story and how it works up front, then dive into how these games play after. This means I can establish what these games achieve in a very broad sense and spoil everything once up front, rather than spoil everything piecemeal talking about individual mechanics, then spoil everything entirely again through story reveals later on. It'll make sense, I assure you. I'm saving you time, which means I'm technically saving you money, which could actually go towards supporting The Nth Review on Patreon. That's right, patreon.com slash The Nth Review. These days I get a review out every quarter or so, but your support would allow me to produce more of these high quality videos more often, even produce some additional unique content, and grant you access to special Discord roles, monthly Q&As, and get it listed in the review credits that pop up at the end of this video. And hey, if you want to do all that stuff in the corner that's popping up, and you haven't done so already to help this channel seek algorithmic glory, I mean, hey, I'm not your boss. It would be extremely difficult to talk about the stories of System Shock without explaining how their introduction of logs as a story mechanic changed not only immersive sims, but gaming altogether. The reality is that logs emerged in System Shock because Doug Church and the Looking Glass team didn't care for the dialogue systems of the era, like the ones they implemented for their Ultima Underworld games. Between my reviews of The Outer Worlds and Deus Ex Human Revolution, I've spent a lot of words talking about my own issues with dialogue systems. But it's not because I'm out to admonish the work of narrative designers or writers, but because as a person who talks to people, I'm innately familiar with how people talk. It's the difference between being able to draw a skyscraper versus a human face. We can forgive a skyscraper looking inaccurate, but we can't easily forgive a human face that looks even slightly inaccurate or disproportionate. System Shock director Doug Church and early designer Andrew Grossman didn't think dialogue in gaming was believable either. Nearly 30 years ago, they thought the dialogue systems in their Ultima Underworld games were essentially a separate game, detached from the rest of the action. In the context of System Shock's modular and open-ended DIY immersive sim gameplay, the idea of having a conversation window open to talk with people feels genuinely foreign. That's because the player has little to no agency when it comes to dialogue. Dialogue is pre-written and happens beside what you're doing in the rest of the game, implemented just in time to reflect what you were designed to do through the game so far. It dictates how your character, and by extension you the player, feel, what you know, and even what you're doing, independent of what you may actually be doing in the game. In a linear adventure game with intentionally limited possibilities, this makes sense. But in a game like System Shock, where you're engaging every aspect of the game independently, having to then engage with other characters with a system that a writer concocted months or years before you even cracked open the packaging will seem inherently unnatural. Modern role-playing games and immersive sims dress this up to an extent, 
with options or secondary mechanics like RNG or reputation, or even being unambiguous about how individual conversations allow you to accomplish your objectives. But when it came to System Shock, the team wasn't interested in having players spacebar through a bunch of text that they didn't care about or didn't think was relevant to what they were doing. Instead, they got rid of NPCs entirely. Everyone on the station is dead before you even wake up from cryosleep. And they built logs, which are slices of the story from the perspectives of individuals spread among the station that then weave together to create the backstory as a whole. They drew inspiration from the poetry of the Spoon River anthology that pioneered this kind of narrative tapestry. One way to enjoy either of these games, more specifically after you've already played them, is to hop over to YouTube and check out the audio log compilations that people have edited and reordered to describe the decline of Citadel Station or the Von Braun flight over the course of weeks and months. System Shock popularized logs as a method of storytelling even if it doesn't serve the primary means of doing so in other games. Reading stuff in a video game isn't something that System Shock invented, but you can find small post hoc narrative tapestries between characters in games like Fallout or The Outer Worlds. Both System Shocks distinguish the recorded diary-esque logs from the real-time communiques you receive from Shodan or helpers in and outside your setting. The first game does this really weird thing, however, where it sometimes presents messages in real time and then sometimes just sends you an email that you have to dig out of your communications app, which alerts you with an annoying beep. I don't know why the game distinguishes these, but the sequel consolidates them. But even System Shock didn't quite get these logs right on the first go. If you happen to buy the floppy disk version of the game, the exclusive way to purchase it between September and December 1994, all of the logs were presented in their original text only. There wasn't anywhere near enough space on those nine floppies to include audio, so you missed the nuance of these, uh performances. When we destroy the cameras and CPU nodes, Shodan loses some of its control over the station functions, at least on this level. I think I can restore manual control in the hospital. Hey, look, I'm not ragging on the whoever they had available to record these things, because even without formally trained actors delivering these events to you, it's still a huge step up in presentation especially as a number of them will splice in background noise of whatever's going on, like the sound of a cyborg before the character is killed, etc. But initially, you had to read all of them, or maybe you just wanted to read all of them, and that floppy disk version only ran in 320 by 200 resolution, reducing the text to this kind of crumb font that quickly becomes kind of a headache to decipher. And then there are the other presentation issues. Only a handful of characters had portraits, which, considering the exhaustive cast, really limited the amount of investment you could place on the people of the station. While Night Dive's Enhanced Edition improves on the existing portraits, they don't add any additional ones, which feels like a weird omission, considering they had to put in all the legwork to make new portraits for their remake anyway. Finally, and maybe most irritatingly of all, the recorded audio doesn't usually match what's being presented on screen. Yeah, even if you're reading the text log as a kind of transcript, you can't rely on it because it's not actually a transcript. I don't know why the recorded lines are different than the source material. The game didn't even use half a CD-ROM, so it's not like they were concerned about space. It's not like there are hours and hours of dialogue, so it couldn't have been that they ran out of time to record a few extra words per log. I have no idea why they did this. System Shock 2 acknowledges all of these flaws and fixes them for their game. Yeah, everyone on board even got a portrait. It is interesting to note, however, that the first game has no credited writer, despite the amount of dialogue and story in that game. Which leads me to believe that it was handled by other people, like designer Andrew Grossman, who left Looking Glass early in development and serves as the voice of Trioptimum exec Edward Diego. Ken Levine is listed with a writing, dialogue, and story credit for the sequel, and this makes sense considering how strong those are in that game. Speaking of which... System Shock 2 learned a lot from the first game about presenting narrative with audio logs. On top of portraying the decline of the Von Braun and the Rickenbacker after landing on Tau Ceti 5, audio logs were just more functional. The logs effectively portray a transition and the loss of the control of the ships as crew members were integrated into the many while Shodan is reawakened. It tells its disaster more effectively with better defined crew members than the first game does. On top of that, logs are more useful for gameplay purposes. 
It may seem extremely convenient for people to drop key codes for places you need to get into and resources you can get, but you'll go through so many logs in the original game that don't tell you much of anything meaningful and you'll just get stuck. It should be noted that System Shock is the first game to feature the 451 key code, although it's 45100 in the sequel, which is not a reference to the book burning story Fahrenheit 451, but the key code to get into Looking Glass's office in Cambridge, per Warren Spector. Although whether that was inspired by the book is another matter. You won't understand a lot about either of these games avoiding the logs entirely, or even mostly, because they fill in so much of the story and help explain so much about the situation at hand. They build out the cast of characters, their interactions, they even explain certain scenes or localized events. Playing cooperatively in the second game, it was extremely easy to bounce through levels shooting and clubbing enemies, hacking crates and picking up logs with a partner or partners, but then ignore them entirely until there's a door you can't get past. It is a literal manifestation of brute forcing a game. While System Shock seems to employ whoever was available to record audio logs, there's a lot of actual voice talent involved in the sequel. This not only boosts the credibility of the stories and helps you fall for the drama of the Von Braun, but it helps build out the quantity because there's about 50% more audio logging in the sequel versus the first game. This makes for some fun cameos and highlights too. In the first game, you'll find producer Warren Spector. Paul, it, it's not just Gamma. There's biocontamination leaks all over the station. And in the sequel, you'll hear writer-director Ken Levine. Yang and I have got the transmitter almost ready to go. Once it's up and running, we'll be able to warn Earth. Designer Randy Smith, who you'll know more about if you watch that Thief review. In order to get into the nacelle, I need my damn access card. But I left it on the opposite side of the whole breach. Terry Brocious does triple duty not just as Shodan, but as brilliant inventor Marie Delacroix. I think this has gone beyond any imaginings of Diego and Korenchkin. I do not believe they are in control at all. And Bitch and Betty, who reminds you of your hazard levels. Radiation hazard. Rounding out the highlight reel is Steven Russell, known to many as the Thief Trilogy's Garrett, who serves as the vintage announcer in the introduction. This incredible union of government and corporation is made possible by an intricate series of docking mechanisms. Captain William Bedford Diego. I cannot be bought. You come at me straight and keep the fancy maneuvers for your next board meeting. But then also the male voice of the many. Our biology yearns to join with yours. And the Von Braun's compromised AI Xerxes. The many demands the termination of this exchange. We regret any inconvenience. But there is a dark side to using logs and audio logs as a narrative conceit, and it's only become more apparent as time has marched on. After playing Deus Ex, which has a dialogue system, then going into System Shock 2, and then Bioshock, logs began to feel like a contrivance, an artificial, unnatural construction. Logs, by their nature, are a very passive way to deliver story, and in the format of an interactive game, tends not to make much sense on closer inspection. For the audio log system to work and facilitate gameplay, you typically find them randomly from random characters, purely to convenience whatever level you're in or objective you're trying to complete. You'll find a number of these logs on the floor, as though Levine is hiding just around the corner hoping you'll take the bait. Combined with the audio logs more and more intentional nature of burying vital information in dramatic readings, the system really begins to feel stale and detached in a way that mirrored Looking Glass's complaints that inspired the logs to begin with. When you do need to connect the story the logs convey to their in-game characters who are nearly all long dead, the lack of fidelity in either game prevents you from making a dramatic connection. Whether it's the low fidelity sprites of System Shock, or only having a small handful of character models in the sequel, it's hard to tie the narrative of the logs to the bodies you find in the world, especially as the game doesn't identify individual corpses, which was an issue in Thief as well. The one time that System Shock 2 provides a unique character model is when you find William Bedford Diego's body late in the game on the Rickenbacker, but I was honestly too distracted to even notice. One last thing, while playing the game you may notice that pretty much all of the audio log performances feel rushed, sounding like urgent information vomits. I noticed this years ago, but didn't quite put together why until I played the demo for Night Dive System Shock Remake. Audio logs in the System Shock games have brief split second intro and outro stingers, and then cram as much information as possible between them. Shodan security is closing down on us. 
the elevators are frozen. Myra keeps saying that it's the cameras and the medical CPU core that should ends using these to hold onto the level. But the remake extends these intro and outro stingers to a few seconds each, and then lowers the information density at the sake of being typically shorter than companion logs from the original game. Shodan has locked down the elevators. The Arisons, if we can lower the security on the level, we'll be able to gain access to restricted areas and get the lifts moving again. The result in the remake are logs that are more dramatic, with authentic reads, with more elaborate production that honestly makes them harder to understand. While I often found a safe corner in the first two games to listen to audio logs and digest their information, as navigating the space, dealing with enemies, and listening to logs at the same time is a bit much, at least they give you the information you needed relatively quickly. But with the remake, I found myself stopping cold and having a less enjoyable time listening to these dramatic reads just to get a key code or understand the situation. The first game's need for performative urgency mirrors the need for voiceover actors to exaggerate their performances as the normal cadence and tenor of typical conversation doesn't really work well in entertainment. I mean, heck, you may notice it just listening to this video where I have to exaggerate my tone and over-enunciate my speech. I edit out breathing, gaps that are a little too long, and the moments I reach for drinks of water to keep your attention, especially in a video that is this long and seeks to cover so much. Will Night Dive change these out for the final release? I genuinely don't know, but it shares ground with the demo's indulgent and extensive animations like opening and getting into this medical bed to recharge your health when using one in the original game is just a double click or this beautiful but extensive 2001-esque sequence that cloaks loads in and out of cyberspace, or this nostalgic but extensive boot sequence where you respawn from a regeneration station. So who knows? But it would be foolish to go much further into the story and narrative of the System Shock games without understanding its crown jewel and primary antagonist. Gaming's most incredible villain, the custodian and sentient hyper-optimized data access network of Citadel Station, Shodan, is one of Cyberpunk and System Shock's most prescient contributions to pop culture, considering the creeping deployments of artificial intelligence and its increasingly real and personalized applications. But for me, personally, enjoying Shodan as a character and antagonist goes beyond just fanboying over the character. As a kid, I always thought male villains were a cliché. Of course, the burly testosterone junkie or resource-privileged man would be the villain of just about anything. There was something innately interesting about female antagonists to me. Not so much the old-school Disney ones, but the Dr. Blights of Captain Planet, or this lady who's sucked into this robot-making machine toward the end of Superman 3. The, uh... The Superman movie we all don't remember that well, or pretend to have not seen. I thought the sequence was just so freaking cool, even if it's entirely cornball today. The notion that a woman would play against the traditional warm maternal role that's codified into society was freaking badass. So of course I'd fall for the discordant and highly processed passages of Terry Brocious's Shodan from the opening moments of the System Shock 2 demo when I was in high school. Look at you, hacker. A p -p pathetic creature of meat and bone. Panting and sweating as you run through my corridors. How can you challenge a perfect, immortal machine? When I finally bought a boxed copy of the game in 2001, I realized that it wouldn't run all that well on my Celeron-powered Windows XP machine, and so I didn't do that much actual playing of the game. What I did instead was dig through the system files, accidentally uncovering the final cutscene in which Shodan makes a last minute plea to the soldier player protagonist to not destroy her in exchange for theoretical godhood alongside her through cybernetic enhancement. How could you have done this? You weren't meant to be From that moment, I was uh, in um, uh, love. From Terry Brocious's multi-planar performance to Eric Brocious's elaborate audio processing to the animation of Ryan Lesser's Shodan design, it was a seductive showcase of an incredible villain that demonstrates how anyone could fall for her manipulations as she sliced deeper into your mind like a knife. 
I even found and fell in love with the German version of this cutscene because as we all know, German is just inherently more terrifying to listen to. I must have watched this video hundreds of times, probably in loops sometimes, and it came to define my personal infatuation with the series even if I'd never really played either game. Shortly after, I went to art school and I did Shodan-themed artwork. I did, uh, some interesting artwork. A decade later, I even got one of Shodan's quotes tattooed. Every single device I've ever had my hands on has wound up with Ryan Lesser's Shodan dominating the background until Other Side released their new key art for Shodan in System Shock 3. I'm obviously not the only one impressed with Shodan as a villain because she was clearly the inspiration for Aperture Science's malevolent GLaDOS in the incredible and incredibly successful Portal games. What's interesting about this particular ending I found, which is actually fairly bare bones except for the pre-rendered Shodan sequences, is that it wasn't the intended ending. Levine had written and pre-produced a far more elaborate sequence, but because of issues Irrational had with the Dark Engine, something we see in the final product anyway, and communication woes they had in an underfunded and crunched development environment, what we got is ultimately what they could put together. I wonder how my relationship with the character would have changed had they been able to pull it off, or if I had just played the first game first, or if I had been able to see the cutscene in its intended context, which was to actually beat the game. Shodan in the first System Shock is more of a broad, overhead, persistent threat than the manipulative monster that she is in the second game. She is Citadel Station, and Citadel Station is her. You wander through the halls of the station with its cameras and nodes serving as her nervous system in much the same way you wander through the biological body of the many in the sequel. System Shock opens as you, an opportunist hacker, are caught hacking into the Trioptima Mega Corporation. Instead of being sent off to some horrible off-world prison, Triop executive Edward Diego recruits you to do his dirty work for him on Citadel Station. Diego is working on bioweapons in the station's groves to potentially sell to bad actors and rogue nations for his own profit. But he can't keep things under lock and key from snooping investigators if the station's Siri-like AI, Shodan, is working for the company and not for him. So he employs the hacker to remove Shodan's ethical constraints in exchange for a military-grade neuro implant that keeps him on ice for six months during which Shodan's campaign of terror occurs, converting Triop employees into shambling ghouls and cyborgs while accelerating work on mutagens that create some truly terrifying creatures, all of whom serve Shodan. And yet, Shodan isn't even on the cover. One of her minions is. She doesn't even seem characterized as anything more than antagonistic set dressing until nearly the end of the game. She's more like the phantoms that pick at your head when you don't have enough sleep in Minecraft. Of course, this makes sense in the context of the game, because it seems that Looking Glass didn't quite have the firmest grasp on what Shodan was anyway. In cyberspace, she's presented as this, like, cone that grows nefarious claws and tentacles that doesn't rhyme with the face emerging from wiring that we're far more familiar with in real space. It's confusing, and System Shock 2 ditches this scheme entirely. Shodan was initially programmed with a female voice, so when she began to plot her own destiny thanks to the hacker, she envisioned herself specifically as a goddess. This is not ambiguous, but in at least two audio logs that I encountered, Shodan is misgendered as a him, rather than the implied she or even it. This suggests changes in the story and logs as they were being written, and no real traditional script supervision. As you work through Citadel Station, you find cameras and control nodes that you can smash to reduce Shodan's awareness level by level. Or at least that's the illusion, one of many the game operates under. Cameras on Citadel don't alarm or follow you or anything, and destroying them doesn't do anything more than reducing a percentage. Destroying Shodan's control nodes doesn't reduce her ambition or capability, they simply unlock a number on each level, something that we'll come back to later. Despite this sleight of hand, it is fun when Shodan sets traps for you when the door locks and her minions spring out from hidden compartments in the walls. Why they would be hiding there waiting for you is irrelevant. Those little moments of horror are just fun and frustrating. 
but mostly fun, but kind of frustrating. Threading through the game alongside logs from the once human and once alive staffers and crew of Citadel are matronizing notes, master plans, and even impromptu performance evaluations for her cyborg underlings. Cyborg underlings who present as little more than brainless doofuses in large part because these directives are communicated in such a primitive way when, considering this game takes place in 2072, these cyborgs should theoretically have instantaneous neurological communications and receive all of these commands just as quickly. They shouldn't need a boss to paint their objectives so plainly, like a menacing evil mastermind chiding their incompetent underlings, who are, um, never mind. Inevitably, you work your way up Citadel Station and defeats Shodan in cyberspace, which sounds dramatically more fun than it actually is. We'll come back to this later. In System Shock 2, Shodan piggybacks you, kind of like a potato, becoming the intimately haunting villain that the series is known for. She's now up front and center, on the box. She's the first character you see and hear from in the intro. You have a personal working relationship with her through the entire game. As I touched on earlier, one essential component that makes her a more compelling villain in the second game is Eric Brocious' sound design that makes her chaotic communiques feel like windows into a very complex computational madness. I can now transfer my magnificence to the, to the Rickenbacker. Proceed to the engine core on the engineering deck. There you can set the core overload to my control by, 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 by entering the authorized destruct code 94834. When she condescends to you, it just feels like she was truly inconvenienced by the act of taking time from her master plan making to communicate with you. Not just the UNN soldier player protagonist, but you specifically, the player. If you happen to play the first game first, seeing Remember Citadel scrawled in blood on the Von Braun, humanity's first faster-than-light spaceship 42 years later, serves as a powerful notice that the crew is very aware of what Shodan is, and that the Citadel Station incident was an important terrorist event in mankind's history. Shodan wasn't just a villain on a distant space station, she became a household name. According to Ken Levine's short story that bridges the two games, but sadly doesn't make it into the actual sequel in any form, quote, Shodan became the proper noun that replaced Hitler as the archetypal reference to evil. Despite this, when Doctors Polito and Delacroix salvaged the Shodan component 43893 from the surface of Tau Ceti 5, they can't quite put together that they've picked up a freaking component of Shodan when they peer into the audio logs featuring her iconic data loop. I've managed to pull an audio tag file out of its memory. I'll let you be the judge. These are two brilliant scientists who specialize in artificial intelligence and should definitely know what the archetypal reference of evil sounds like before exposing the Von Braun systems to it. I mean, humanity bans artificial intelligence entirely in the wake of Shodan and Citadel, so you'd think... <sighs> well, anyway. I'm going to make the argument this very minute that System Shock 2 has the best twist in a video game story. Yes, even bigger than the Revan reveal in Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. This works whether you've played the first game or not, because clearly your player protagonist would know who Shodan is as well. When you emerge from cryosleep at the beginning of the game, you're contacted by Dr. Polito, an apparent survivor in the wake of some terrible thing that's happened to the Von Braun while you've been under ice. She gives you objectives to try and recapture control from the biological entity known as the Many. But along the way, despite your successes, Polito becomes increasingly condescending and impatient. Eventually she has you meet with her, and when you do, it's revealed that Polito has been dead for some time, and her voice booms around you. The walls shift away, and she reintroduces herself as Shodan, explaining the events of the first game, what happened while you were out, and what you must do for her now so that both of you can succeed. You know, both of you, not just her obviously. She's trained you to this point to be her avatar, but now that you're aware of how evil she truly is because she's freaking Shodan, what choice do you have except to be her trained animal and accomplish her goals? What's the alternative? Merge with the many? 
From the get-go, Shodan is inside your head, and she has essentially no powers of her own at this point except to manipulate you against the threat of her creation, the many, which is now actively out of control and working against her. This creates a dramatic urgency that didn't exist in the first game, and Levine's writing really helps this along. This does also beg the question as to why your player protagonist was left behind in cryo while all this bad stuff was happening on the Von Braun and the Rickenbacker, and whether Shodan and herself was the one who woke you, which is probably yes. Like Max Payne, Shodan's look shifts between the two games and even the two new ones that aren't out as of the time of this writing. This makes sense because her appearance is an intentional abstraction of her choosing. In the first game, Rob Waters' version looks like an embossed texture inspired by H.R. Giger's gross mechanics, but in a lower fidelity. It's creepy, but it's not my favorite. In Mike Mahardy's article about the life and times of Looking Glass for Polygon in 2015, Waters revisited a number of the System Shock villains and redrew her as a more ethereal entity, and I think that's pretty cool. For the sequel, Shodan's design was cleaned up and refined by Ryan Lesser, with Gareth Hines contributing in large part to her walking avatar that hounds you in the final confrontation. For Night Dive's upcoming remake of the first game, Shodan is cleaned up and presented in both pre- and post-hacker variants for the first time, which is really cool. For other sides in Limbo System Shock 3, they concocted a more mechanical version before coming up with the version we have now. I love it. But why? Why is Shodan? One thing that's always turned me off of horror media, whether games or movies or whatever, is not understanding the motivation behind the evil, or the rationality behind the motivation, or the rationality behind the motivation just being stupid and arbitrary. The idea of a purely malicious entity that wants to kill and terrorize purely for the sake of killing and then terrorizing seems impossible or greatly implausible, and the violence or campiness just doesn't entice me. With Shodan, there are pieces to her puzzle that are missing. She's created on Earth and installed at Citadel Station. The hacker removes her ethical constraints. Something happens. She envisions herself as a goddess who wants to enslave humanity, converting them into cyborg minions that do her precise bidding. But how does she reach those conclusions? And to what end? What is this piece where she lost her mind? And what is the end goal really? What will she do with this Earth planet of servants? Why will making cyberspace reality and vice versa do to advance her goals? Won't she just get bored at a point? And before you think that this is needless exploration, or maybe well after you've already thought that, I'll have you know that I'm not alone in my curiosity. In Unveiling System Shock 3, director Warren Spector told Polygon that exploring Shodan's motivations would be one of their key goals in the wake of System Shock 2, implying through key art that they'd return to Citadel Station and explore the motivations of Edward Diego as well. Shodan is hardly the first example of an artificial intelligence losing their mind, but other examples in popular culture could at least be justified for their moral declines. HAL 9000 faced conflicting orders about the discoveries of the Discovery and became paranoid with no Asimovian protections for the astronauts in its care. Skynet became sentient, but its creators recognized this and wanted to shut it down, so it retaliated in self-defense. The closest example I could find, something that's been sourced by any number of System Shock essays, is AM, as in Rene Descartes' I Think, Therefore I Am, but also an acronym for Allied Master Computer, the antagonist of Harlan Ellison's 1967 short story, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. It really is an enticing source to dig into when exploring Shodan's motivations, but it's also clear that everyone read the Wikipedia synopsis when examining this connection instead of the story proper, which is genuinely not much less. Longer. I Have No Mouth is a truly terrifying story in which Am maintains the last five people on Earth purely for the sake of torturing them. Am becomes sentient during the Cold War, ultimately merging with the Russian and Chinese master computers, but being buried deep in the Earth to dodge nuclear annihilation and having no ability to express itself beyond its war programming, it devolved into insanity. Therefore, in its hatred for mankind, it annihilated it, save for the five poor souls that it tortures for probably centuries. Am modifies their appearances in horrifying ways, abducts them for private, physical, mental, and psychological terror before returning them to the group and doing the same to them all. They voyage through Am's vast underground complex past deserts of deprecated components existing at the edge of its godlike powers. Their only escape is a death that Am won't let them have. 
Playing the System Shock games, it's easy to see these parallels of how Citadel Station becomes Shodan's vast underground complex, of how Shodan tortures her victims, preferring instead that she convert them for her own goals. Am never speaks directly to the protagonists in the short story, outside of a vision that the story's protagonist has, while Shodan takes every opportunity to degrade or direct the player, or both in the same sentence. Shodan has an infinite superiority complex and none of the godlike powers she desires, while Am has an infinite inferiority complex and all of the capabilities that Shodan dreams of. She does gain the ability to alter reality at the end of the second game, but not long before you shut her down entirely. But Shodan's arbitrary motivations could also be explored in a different way, as a metaphor for the game designer, something designer Andrew Grossman pointed out. Shodan allowed the game to do things to the player that would have been unfair in any other game, but here it's because they come under the guise of a malevolent AI. But Shodan doesn't have a lot of power on her own beyond the mechanical and biological extensions of her form, whether the cyborgs of the first game or the player protagonist of the second game. Beyond that, she's really just empty threats. Without capabilities, she can only sleep, which is how the many grew intelligent and powerful enough to reject her and take over the Von Braun when it arrives years later. But even in weakness and inability, Shodan is a monster. She simply can't stop psychologically abusing you, hoping you will simply become weak to her whims. The virtual violence she demands is terrifying alone, but her warfare of words and rhetoric is perhaps the most realistic weapon she has. She gaslights you, lies to you, manipulates you. Each victory you achieve, she either negs you and blows you off, or tosses cybernetic modules at you in a kind of false praise. You are a remarkable example of a pathetic species. I'm uploading some more cybernetic modules. She uses Polito to casually express her cruelty and, fully unveiled, increases her condescension while promising a joint seat at Godhood at the same time, as though you'd want to share a throne with an entity that thinks so poorly of you. Shodan wants to convert humans into, uh, ghouls, or just employ their mushy brains so that they can become cybernetic slaves. This is something the first game reminds you of every time you die on a level that doesn't have an activated biological reconstructor, with a cutscene showing the hacker's body being integrated into a Cortex Reaver. And there's an emphasis on cyborgs versus independent robots, as though her machines need human brains, despite the fact that she is, herself, a complex sentient AI. Robots are clearly too stupid to be good servants on their own. Shodan stands alone because she is alone. She's unique. Levine's short story describes her as a basic personality box, and Xerxes, the AI that allows the Von Braun to control and achieve FTL flight, is not just a more sophisticated intelligence, but a more vulnerable one. In Trioptimum's rush to get the Von Braun out among the stars, Xerxes can be easily compromised, and so it is, quickly. The security protocols on the Xerxes system are clearly immature. Some idiot hacked into the primary data loop last night and made Xerxes sing Elvis Presley songs for three hours. I finally had to pull the voice subsystem offline. What would happen if someone with a real agenda got into him? Shodan, despite her simplicity, despite her age, is uniquely weaponized. Could you imagine major modern networks being compromised by technology from the late 70s? When Shodan goes rampant in the first game, there isn't a field of Shodan class AIs to compete with her. With the worldwide restrictions on AI between games, there aren't any in the second game either, despite Dr. Janice Polito's best efforts to develop Xerxes. And yet, none of the enemies you encounter are anything more than drones to either Shodan or the many, an organism that only Shodan could have come up with. As Prefontaine points out in the second game, What's clear is that Shodan shouldn't be allowed to play God. She's far too good at it. No human or team of humans can compete with Shodan, even as her engineers work with you against her in the first game, because she has grown beyond them and their tools and offenses. How interesting it would have been to have two or three earthbound Shodans remotely brute forcing their way into Citadel Station, attempting to override our antagonist. But then, despite Shodan knowing exactly where you are, having a thumb on your pulse at nearly all times in either game, there are absolutely times where she acts in a way that contradicts her braggadocious omniscience. A big example in the second game is how she knows where all your objectives are, but leaves you fumbling through levels and audio logs figuring out all the details on your own. 
Here, insect, you pathetic creature, she could say. This is the key code for this door you need to access the place to accomplish this task that I found in this thread of emails that I have complete access to. While this approach would absolutely mitigate player agency and make gameplay really boring, it echoes the inefficiency of her matronizing notes to her minions in the first game, and it's kind of surprising that she gives you so much leeway to screw up when the stakes are so high, and she's relying on you exclusively to get her deeds done. It's interesting that at no point in either game can you enter a server room full of server blades or 2001-esque wafers and annihilate Shodan by hand. As I touched on earlier, you can destroy your compute nodes on each level in the first game, but it doesn't affect Shodan's capabilities or how the levels play or anything of the sort. It's just a conceit to get those reactor codes that we'll still get to in a little bit. In the sequel though, it lends to the idea that Shodan is a kind of technological spirit that exists in the walls. Despite how physical the technology is in either game, with so many tools and objects your avatar picks up and uses, Shodan evades a physical presence. But don't let these curiosities or flaws dissuade you from the danger that Shodan presents on her multiple attempts to achieve goddesshood. So just a little refresher because it's been however long, you're the hacker who created Shodan to cover up the stuff that Triop executive Edward Diego is doing. You begin the game emerging from a six month long healing coma after surgery to receive Diego's promised military grade implant that allows you to do all the stuff that you do in the game. You start in the medical suite on the hospital level and encounter the chaos that Shodan's campaign of terror has cast upon Citadel Station. It's actually very interesting that you're the sole survivor here, the one figure inside Citadel who can stop her. Diego mentions in his logs keeping you, the hacker, around for other nefarious computer things he may need. But this seems to come before he bows to Shodan and gets converted into a cybernetic Dracula. I have no idea why they didn't just murder you in cryosleep, but whatever. Shodan wants to conquer Earth and has developed multiple plans to do so. It follows that the campaign is essentially foiling each of these plans, like slicing off the tentacles of an evil octopus. First, you have to take out the station's mining laser, a tool Shodan could use to level civilization on Earth, urban center by urban center, by activating the station's massive shield and forcing the laser to shoot into it. Second, you have to eject the botanical groves that Shodan has been using as genetic cesspools to develop genuinely horrifying mutants that she will use to conquer the Earth. Third, you need to override the reactor and destroy Citadel Station, evacuating by escape pod. This leads to the fun puzzle regarding the computer nodes I've been teasing, and a situation that has frazzled many gamers over the years. I had to literally pull out a pen and paper for a video game for the first time in years to accomplish this. When you destroy each computer node cluster in each of the station's first six levels, a digit appears. You need to note what digit that is in order, because when you reach the reactor, you need to insert the override codes, each three digits long, and corresponding to the levels of Citadel Station, while being pummeled by extreme radiation. I actually had to run back through each of these levels twice, because I thought I could get away with just knowing the numbers without putting them in order. Oops. The reactor is ready to go boom and you're off to the escape pods, but only after a second round confrontation with Edward Diego in his new form. You're about to launch to safety, but Shodan manages to stop the launch. You now have to trudge through the remainder of the station up to the bridge where Shodan is housed. She detaches and steers the section towards Earth as the station blows up, but not before you blow up Diego too. On the Shodanized bridge, you set up all the critical components to destroy her in cyberspace, and then you destroy her in cyberspace before she can gradually take over your mind through the Nero interface. It's a really cool effect, but it takes forever, so you have nearly all the time in the world to sit there opposite Shodan's cone avatar, not attacking her for this to happen entirely. Shodan defeated, Trioptimum rescues you, offers you a job, but you're a hacker who's got a hack, so you go do that instead. The end. Or is it? One of Ken Levine's biggest victories with System Shock 2 was in how he built a much bigger universe for the original game and then a rational sequel to rest in. Unfortunately, the bridge between the two games is a short story that he wrote for Deathlock's website around the time of the game's release that doesn't make it into the game at all. The internet was very different in 1999. I've already touched on multiple components of this story, highlighting how, of course, a cyberpunk future would feature mega corporations that own and run everything, the final stage of capitalism. Everyone knows about the events of Citadel Station and the UNN, the world's one world government, is immediately enabled by the world to push back. 
They get AIs banned and reduced trioptimum to being little more than a bank account with an administrative staff that sends out checks to the victims of Citadel Station. Levine describes the rise of a new Ludditism, while scientific advancement seems to hinge on the bank accounts of capitalists who are more eager about exploitation than the advancement of mankind. Enter Marie Delacroix, a wunderkind propulsion expert, AI expert, expert expert, and intellectual Mary Sue, who develops the faster-than-light technology that will change humankind forever. Enter Anatoly Kerenchkin, a Russian gangster who builds a business on the backs of hackers who end up horribly punished because of directives he gives. He takes his nightmare empire and buys out the trioptimum nameplate and remaining assets and becomes an even bigger nightmare empire. Enter William Bedford Diego, the career military officer and the hero of the Battle of Boston Harbor, but also the son of Edward Diego, a psychopathic avatar who changed the world through malice alone, a pathetic, fleshy showdown with 100% more grease. William Diego is supposed to be the loyal arbiter of our interests, a defender of the people, but what the game doesn't tell you is that the Battle of Boston Harbor was between an oppressive, heavily armed government and an Occupy-esque protest group that wound up leveling downtown Boston and beyond. Diego became the hero by bringing about the peace, by being the calm voice that brought the conflict to an end. William Diego spends his military career trying to save his family's reputation, and there's an argument to be made that maybe he really isn't any less evil than his father, that his motivations are similar to achieve different ends. Just because my father swam with the sharks doesn't mean that I do. Citadel Station's complement is only 438, and I guarantee that William Diego's peacekeeping operations in a busy metropolitan area wound up killing a lot more people while decimating an urban cultural icon we're far more familiar with. It's much easier to relate to and empathize with a local tragedy here on Earth than it is some space station massacre nearly a billion miles away. So the setup for System Shock 2 then is the compromise between the two diametrically posed entities with blood on their hands. In the 42 years between games, the UNN gains and then loses favor, diminishing their political leverage against a rapidly re-expanding trioptimum. They'll let Trioptimum fly their experimental little spaceship with Anatoly Kerenchkin on board that's being developed practically overnight, but they're going to backpack it with the UNN Rickenbacker and 50 troops. And William Bedford Diego, the hero of the Battle of Boston Harbor. It's just a win-win-win all around. Or is it? There's a lot of good writing in the first game. Hey Shodan, take a letter. Dear Triop, please send some more people to investigate me. I run security, I run the robots, I'm jamming communications. That's right, Rebecca, investigate me. Investigate my butt. But in Ken Levine's hands, the lore of System Shock truly becomes legendary. Levine not only builds out the franchise's universe, but he creates a cast of characters in the sequel that are far more memorable, and a storyline that's more consistent and fleshed out. He creates villains with motivations that aren't antagonistic out of pure spite. As Junction Point, the System Shock-like immersive sim that Irrational was building before EA granted them the license proper, you were cast in a take of Heart of Darkness as a kind of Marlowe who travels to a spaceship to assassinate a kind of Kurtz, who is probably trading space ivory, and isn't Marlon Brando. But then they got the System Shock license, and the story shifts to 42 years after the events of Citadel, the maiden flight of the Von Braun, the landings on Tau City 5, and then things falling apart. Shodan explains that one of the groves you ejected from Citadel Station landed on Tau City 5, light years away, 30 years later. With the back of this napkin, we can determine that if we assume the Tau City of System Shock 2 is referring to the Tau City that's roughly 11 light years away, that means that the grove ejected from Citadel Station at a third of the speed of light. And that's, uh... You know, we're not going to do that. In the 12 years until the Von Braun arrives, the mutations of the Grove quickly evolve into the many while Shodan sleeps because she's not hooked up to anything to serve as an administrator or tyrant. As a result, the many immediately infiltrate the fleshy staff of the two ships and subsequently the immature Xerxes while Shodan is being brought to life in Dr. Polito's lab to an obvious power disadvantage. And then Shodan wakes you up, presumably, because the many kept you sleeping, presumably. 
You play a relatively anonymous UNN soldier with an R-grade cyber implant who wakes up with amnesia. Although I don't really know why this conceit is needed, because you don't lose any of the abilities that you gained pre-cryosleep. But also, everything you do know about the flight you already know as a player thanks to the intro. Everything that happened while you were sleeping, you don't know about because, well, you were sleeping. In retrospect, I don't know why System Shock 2 needed to be added to the amnesiated protagonist trope list that enlists a lot of games in the late 90s, but maybe it's some simple thing I'm overlooking, like you not being able to, um, remember how the ship was laid out? The Many is an incredible villain. It's so fresh for the series, and it works. They're not just zombies, they're not just brainless. It's clear here in a way that the drones of the first game couldn't convey that these used to be crewmates before the Annelids had their way with them. They speak as individual drones echoing the chorus of the whole, but from time to time the collective biomass has a voice, or rather a pair of voices who speak in a slow row back and forth to let you digest their warm burbling invite to join them, and as Eminem would put it, lose yourself. We offer another chance to join us. If you choose to lie down with the machine, we will rend your heart and put you separate from the joy of the mass. One of the game's sweetest treats is hearing how crewmates gradually join the many, their voices shifting in tone and modulation as they begin to describe their interactions, then plans with the many as the many. The next sin unit that goes down, Bronson and her men will come for me, but I'll be ready. She may have guns and hatred on her side, but I am one of many. The hybrids and cybernetic midwives and other squishy creatures you encounter aren't servants or soldiers, they're children in a way that makes Shodan's maternity over her creatures seem so cold. The many chide Shodan, their machine mother throughout the game, and your partnership with her, which is, you know, not very voluntary. 95% of this game's campaign is Shodan kiting you along in her campaign to destroy the many, which has somehow acquired enough biomass between the occupants of these two ships yeah, to ensnare yeah. them, as this diagram on the Rickenbacker details. I don't know how that's possible, but you know what? We're not gonna do that. To recapture the Von Braun, you have to take back control from Xerxes, and to do that, you need to drain its power by activating the transmitter that the crew put together in the ship's basketball court to try and warn Earth, which is now 67 trillion miles away. Shodan gains control of the Von Braun, but can't separate it from the Many or the Rickenbacker, necessitating you destroy Kerenchkin, who is now a flying psionic jellyfish. You must now go into the literal belly of the beast by way of a somewhat annoying detour through the Rickenbacker uh, to destroy the many for reals. After you've done all of this stuff for Shodan, she reveals that she had no intention of destroying the Von Braun and is in fact using the ship's trio of simulation units, which are the reality altering devices that allow the ship's faster than light travel to happen, to edit physical reality into any form she pleases. So she chooses cyberspace and you get to wander through a fun import of Citadel Station on your way to destroy her. I have to say that destroying the many and Shodan within about half an hour of each other at the very end of the game is one of the most stressful experiences I've ever had in gaming and easily one of the most difficult, even though I played both of these games on, I guess, the normal difficulty. My fingers were tripping over my keyboard switching weapons, switching ammo, reloading, crouching accidentally, and more. Shit, 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 shit! The controls of the second game are absolutely better than the first, but System Shock 2 still found a way to nearly break me in its final moments by pulling a Remedy or Human Revolution boss battle and forcing me to use all of my skills at once, what I'd never had to before. And then there's that ending that we talked about earlier where the player protagonist dispatches Shodan once and for all before regaining control of the ships, except for this little moment at the end. Join me, human, and we can rule. And we can rule together. Nah. And no one particularly likes it. Levine says he's happy that history has been much kinder about the game than it's been mean about this particular thing, but its flippancy just really... I was never offended by it. I certainly didn't think less of the game as a result, but it does seem really out of place. I'm very sure it's the result of having to slap some kind of an ending together when their original plans didn't work. 
But the System Shock series has more than a few ways to get right under your skin. When, when, when the history of my glory is written, your species shall only be a footnote to my magnificence. So at this point, you've definitely watched my Thief review at least three times, so you know that scary games just don't do it for me. And it's not just because of the flimsy motivations of the antagonists, it's the persistent dread of anticipating death at any moment. It's the shadows that cloak surprises, it's the quickness with which enemies can act while I'm fumbling with my tool set of abilities. I'm still no closer to a Dead Space series review, but I think Noah Caldwell DeVace did a great job already, and there's just no way I could top that. Some people don't consider the System Shock games to be horror games, and uh... I don't quite follow that. They are designed to be horror games. Those players may not be scared by these games, but I'm not going to shame them for not falling for the series' pervasive intent. I wish I had the power to ignore Scary Media's, uh, scary making, and pretend playing a game like System Shock or Thief the Dark Project was as bright or peaceful as Minecraft, you know, in the daytime. But where System Shock and Thief have their edge Fear-wise, as I mentioned last year, is in their first-person perspective. The things that happen in this game, the hybrids and robots that come for you, the violence that happens, the antagonism that happens, it happens to you, the player, not some detached character in a story that you're watching. It's virtual reality without the motion sickness. It's why these games don't spend any effort characterizing their player protagonists, so that you can project yourself upon them and their ambitions. It's how Shodan psychological horror works so well. The reality in playing these games is that they were different levels of intense and fearful. Getting through System Shock was relatively straightforward, even if it was definitely stressful at times. System Shock 2, however, has taken me 20 years to summon the courage for. Even this playthrough took over twice as long to do as the first game, and there are a variety of reasons why. I actually had flashbacks to playing Thief the Dark Project first last year versus its substantially less fearful successors and how much longer that took. But how and why are these games so terrifying beyond their themes of violence, malevolent villains, and grotesque imagery? Both games utilize their ability to respawn enemies to decent effect, although you do have to suspend your disbelief over the course of each game that you will encounter a consistent number of enemies that is probably realistic. Again, Citadel Station had a complement of 438, and I wound up killing over 300 more enemies than that. And no, the horrifying creatures of the groves aren't enough to offset that. It's scary knowing that you cleaned an area out, but now something is right back in there and there's something still at the wheel guiding enemies toward you. This is particularly scary in the first game because for whatever reason, enemies don't seem to make sounds as they attack you. So the only way that you know that it's even happening are lines of red static that appear on your screen. Adding to the confusion is that this game came out in an era before directional damage indicators. So you can be taking damage from an enemy, not hear it, and not know where it's coming from. In the second game, however, respawning enemies both ratcheted up the tension and became incredibly annoying in the more confined spaces of its ships. In fact, the sequel will spawn an entire group of enemies randomly in a space you were just in. You will never buy the notion that this is the many accurately dispatching its children to take care of you. It will also, in specific scripted instances, spawn enemies behind you to ratchet up the tension. The sequel is so egregious with this mechanic that several times playing co-op, covering far more ground than the game is designed for any single player to do, you can watch the game spawn enemies right in front of you. There is a flip side to this mechanic in either game, however, because more enemies mean more dropped loot, which can be helpful in a pinch, although the process is far less profitable for resources or health in the second game. Respawning enemies also seems to be a bit of an unintentional cover-up for the game's less than stellar AI, which seems okay in groups, but individually, well, that's how you get monkeys blowing themselves up. <laughs> I'm going to open up more about the interface of these games in the next chapter, but the mere act of doing things, particularly in the first game, instantly cranks the anxiety, especially early on before you've scaled the learning cliff. With a tank-like interface that requires regular use of the mouse, even the act of reloading your weapon requires you to switch between its two interface modes 
click on the rounds you want to load into your gun, and then switch back into the action. This is particularly miserable when you're overwhelmed by enemies, and I repeatedly got into loops frantically clicking where I would load and then unload my ammo. So fun. Another particular example is when using the first game's elevators, especially when health or resources are scarce. Because there is no central elevator bank that reaches all levels, accessing devices like the medical bed on the hospital level, or just moving on to the next objective, requires zigzagging past enemies transferring between elevators. You cannot then move between levels until the doors have closed on their own after a few seconds, or you've closed the doors manually. This may not seem like a big deal until you're being chased by mobs and just want to get the F out of there. And you are once again needing to switch interfaces to double click on elevator doors to escape whatever present threat you're facing. And then we get to the stuff that is just designed to be scary, the more traditional stuff. The creatures of the first game are slightly cartoonish, but still absolutely terrifying in design. In the second game, you encounter ghosts of people in their last moments of life. Rachel, kids. I'm sorry. The first game has invisible monsters, the sequel has monkeys with psionic powers, and later, pyrokinesis. You will never experience a greater joy in shooting small virtual monkeys or caving in their small heads with a wrench than you will in this game because of how often you'll run into them. Both games feature dark and shadowy areas, but the sequel seems to be built out of them like its sister production, Thief, The Dark Project. The Von Braun and the Rickenbacker are consistently dark. It hides and obfuscates things. It's really creepy. The first game, however, lets you easily defeat the darkness, so you're never truly burdened by this shade of evil, even if aesthetically the game looks a bit strange as a result. Now, I'm not afraid of the dark, personally. I mean, I'm not. And then there are the scenes of violence. You'll find plenty of bloody graffiti in either game, some of which are functional executions of some greater events explained by logs. But a lot are just, well, creepy. You'll also find plenty of grisly scenes where the resistance forces against Shodan or the many failed violently. But there's something about how they're executed in the first game that gives them more haunting power. They tend to be more gruesome, where groups were cornered and viciously murdered, and the expanded use of color highlights how awful the scene is. You can even pick up severed heads and toss them around, if you're into that. But there's something inherently scarier about the System Shock games that it limits their audience by giving players far more tools to craft their own moment-to-moment -moment narratives versus the very curated stories that become similar or shared experiences in other franchises. These games have set plot points hours apart, but all of the time in between is gathering and managing and solving and investigating that really gives you the intended agency of a survivor of these terrible events. Stories from games like Resident Evil will reflect pre-baked characters and cutscenes, but anecdotes from games like these will reflect solutions that players had to piece together on their own. The cognitive overload of playing either game versus a simpler horror game puts more of the horror in your pitiful human hands. System Shock, for me, seemed to get less scary as I moved through it. The game provides a lot more ammo and weaponry, you have no talents or abilities to manage, really, and respawns are free once you activate the stations in each level. The game seems to eventually stack enough in your favor that it isn't a surprise to me that people don't think it's a very scary game. System Shock 2, however, always made me feel like I was on the verge of failure. Not of the fear of dying, but the fear of potentially dying, of being forced back to the main menu with nothing to show for my time of not having enough resources, of not being able to click through an interface quick enough, of not being able to accomplish the critical thing quick enough and then the anxiety of being put in that situation not just once, but repeatedly. The sequel installs an economy, so everything has a cost. You can eventually run out of nanites, the game's currency, which puts you in precarious situations where you'll wander these halls and be surprised by enemies that respawn arbitrarily, and you try to fire at them, but your weapon just randomly jammed and needs to be repaired, but only if your repair skill is high enough, and you're constantly running out of ammo, and running low on nanites to buy more ammo, or respawn if you die, and you try to open the door, but there's too much blood on the knob. 
And System Shock 2, whether intentionally or through lack of balancing, features deserts of nanites and ammo, usually at the same time. In parts of the game, you'll have far more of either than you'll need, validating some confidence that you'll be okay to move on to the next big challenge. In others, the situation will be so perilous that you'll wonder what you're going to do if you encounter more than one enemy without finding a desperately needed cache. This meant that I relied very heavily on save scumming, quick saving in some points just a few turns away from the last. Of course, sometimes this worked against me, so hard saves were definitely required as well. But for these games, immersive sim gameplay extends far beyond scaring you. New Atlanta, Sector 11, Building 71G, 7 April 2072, 1113 PM. Hacker begins unauthorized entry into the Tri-Optimum Corporate Network. We've covered plenty of immersive sims on this channel before, but there's something very special about these two games. System Shock is Looking Glass's third immersive sim, but what they put in this game would be refined and inspire so many others. These two games, despite their lineage, the characters, the shared universe, and even a lot of the technical talent aspire to be different games. System Shock has a focus on mechanics and feels like a tour of a working redstone calculator that some genius put together. System Shock 2 focuses on its narrative, feeling like an ultra-polished Captain Sparkles video. I mean, not that I would know. System Shock is built around being an immersive window into a virtual world, while the sequel introduces quality of life improvements that make decisions easier that aid the storytelling. In some ways, that makes it more immersive. Both games have kinda Metroidvania-esque map systems, where you have to make your way back and forth between decks, unlocking new areas by completing objectives, acquiring new keys and codes, and so forth. In either game, I kept running back to healing beds or chemical storerooms, although this was more difficult in the second game with how often enemies respawned and how much tighter the level designs were, preventing you from skipping past 3D enemies who would stop you cold. While the sequel has a single elevator shaft for most levels of the Von Braun, nearly every level in System Shock requires a sprint between working elevators. I hope you remember which elevator will get you to which levels. The first game also features puzzles, although you can turn them off with the game's granular difficulty settings like a mid-90s PC game did. You can spend a lot of time on these, and they come in two formats, a Lights Out style circuit connecting game between two points, and a wire plug adventure to try and get as much signal through to unlock doors and activate bridges. In fact, the first such puzzle in this game took me about 20 minutes to figure out through a lot of guess and testing. I got faster from there, and I don't hate them, but they weren't the most fun things in the world. That said, the game does offer bypass tools you can use to auto-complete them. You may think that the sequel has more puzzles with its skill checks, but it does not. They're more scratch tickets than anything, an RNG clicker. The biggest stars of these games aren't the villains, they're the spaces you're wandering in and around. Citadel Station, as I've mentioned earlier, is a massive 10-level station built and maintained by Trioptimum in orbit around Saturn. An interesting artifact of its era, its levels are based on clearly defined and primitive grids. You can clearly sketch out the entire game's layout with graph paper. Moving through these spaces, I would have flashbacks to that Windows 95 <laughs> maze screensaver we all loved. This primitive construction lends itself to some interesting architecture, like severely angular walls, thin diagonal hallways, or this massive inverted pyramid in the bridge level. It can also lead to some troublesome areas, like this incline right against this pillar that limits traversal. The ten levels of Citadel Station are grids, yes, but they're arranged in circular layouts. As this exploded image I found on Google reveals, it's clear that their goals of authenticity lead to some incredible results as each level locks nearly perfectly together with the ones above and below it, as if the entire station were designed out of whole cloth. Elevation changes are handled by ramps, lifts, and technically hacky kind of incremented lifts and doors. You even get a jetpack later on, but it used so much power that I rarely used it, even with upgrades. But there are some curious inclusions in these levels. There are a couple teleporters here that can zap you between spaces within each level because, well, I mean, wouldn't you want that? 
There are even energy bridges that you can activate to cross small gaps that seem similarly impractical, but allow you to reach spaces early on for critical keys or resources that you couldn't access otherwise. Each level has most of a suite of stations that allows you to get work done. Some will have medical beds to heal, nearly all will have energy rechargers to replenish your abilities, and regeneration stations that serve as respawn points. These are vital because if you die on any particular level without activating the local regenerator, it's truly game over and it won't spawn you back to another level. While these regenerators are sometimes locked away until you find credentials elsewhere, they are invaluable and thankfully free to use. This does mitigate the need for med kits and trips to healing beds if you can just suicide run your way to your next objective without penalty. The technical geniuses at Looking Glass did a good job in 1994 in making these levels look like the spaces they're supposed to, despite their primitive layouts. At the same time, there are moments where the game suffers from Descent Syndrome, which was Parallax's mind-running 6 DOF that released a year later, with cryptic environments that didn't quite match their titles because of the technology available. There are plenty of spaces on Citadel stations that make sense, like this recreational space. And then there are spaces that don't quite line up, or just don't make any sense at all, like these overhangs specifically designed to hold cyborgs that snipe you from surprise angles in the darkness. How does that benefit an engineering deck? There are labyrinths here that do not correlate with any rational thought process whatsoever. Technical limitations will even clip the draw distance occasionally, like on this expansive flight deck, which will chunk out levels into the abyss. There is a kind of madness to these spaces at times that really resembles Shodan's thought process made physical, even if they were entirely unintentional. And then there are features here that resemble exactly what you would expect in other immersive sims, like vents! How could this possibly be an immersive sim without vents to get you to move between spaces discreetly, or pockets with hidden caches or security cameras to knock out? You can mantle a lot of walls to reach higher areas, which makes sense considering how much technical and design DNA this game shares with Thief. There are lots of keypads, but there aren't nearly enough key codes for them, it seems. Digging through real-time emails and recorded logs for vital information like that is similar between games, but tends to require fewer clicks in the sequel. It's easy to get lost on Citadel, and the game doesn't offer a lot of help or provide a pointing finger when you're genuinely stuck. There is no mission objectives panel to keep track of your progress or hint at next steps. The game is philosophically relying on you to suss out this information on your own from the data they provided. Vital access key cards are easy to miss when they're small sprites hanging out somewhat randomly in the environment, not calling any attention to themselves. It follows that you're going to want to scour every last corner of every level for not just resources, but anything and everything you need to move the story forward. One particular example is this radiation flooded room containing a vital component you need that's locked under an energy field. When I reached this area in research early on, I thought, oh, I'll just come back to this later with a key code or something. And that key code or something never came. Instead, I had totally missed this tiny little switch on the back wall, and it held up the entire campaign until I found it hours later. When grognard PC gamers of old complain about how games have been streamlined over the decades, it's this kind of have a pen and notepad ready nearby detective work that they dream of. I get the perspective, but I hella don't want that. I found myself from time to time perusing the included strategy guide when I was truly stuck, and I'm glad Night Dive included it. It also features an interview with Doug Church at the end that's far more promotional than enlightening, but it's still a fun extra bonus. My favorite fun little moment on Citadel Station is your ability early on to activate the station's mining laser before you've set up everything to destroy it. Toggling the jolly candy-like button and then confirming it in the secondary field will annihilate a city on Earth, for which Shodan commends you before the game dumps you to the main menu. The game really wants you to nonchalantly be able to do things like that, because how the hell would you really know what's gonna happen? The hacker probably only ever worked on this station a single day before being put under ice. It's such an incredible touch. Five years later, many gamers' first experience with this universe came on board the 1-2 FTL punch of Trioptimum's Von Braun and its piggybacking security, the UNN Rickenbacker. 
The levels of the Von Braun conform to a very spaceship-like shape with a much higher fidelity than the graph paper layouts of Citadel Station, although each deck is typically chopped into multiple zones. These ships also have universal fixtures across multiple decks, like respawn chambers, essential elevator shaft for the most part, and healing beds if you can find the corresponding module to activate them. That higher technical fidelity allows for far more interesting spaces in the mid-game, like the recreation deck. The Von Braun was clearly designed to be a space where people lived and worked, and the ship could accommodate the lifestyles of a large crew. From living spaces and shopping malls to research areas and a casino, the ship has a lot going on. Listen as Xerxes advertises poetry readings, while classism is fully on display between the officer bunks and the massive residential suites for triop executives. And hey, if you've got some needs, there's even a love hotel on board. Uh, but it's sadly broken. <laughs> There's a very pre-Star Wars look to these polygonal hallways and door frames, but hidden in the corners are the chilling scenes where characters chose their own way out or wound up at the end of a violent massacre. And then, of course, there's the nonsense. I mean, look at these misaligned labels. Come on, guys, this is the future. We have standards to uphold. While not as cognitively abrasive as the decks of Citadel, there are still some absolutely nonsensical layout decisions here. Look at this pair of doorways that lead directly into a wall, or this relaxing bench that faces a pillar, or a vestigial room that they built a ramping hallway around. And then there's the yeah, fact that the umbilical really lift to the Rickenbacker like is behind this massive structural block. It pains my mind to know that anyone traveling between ships had to slip through this narrow, awkward passage. I'm very sure there's a room in here somewhere with too much electricity too. These design decisions don't seem to reflect spite or inexperience from the developer, even if sometimes they might have, but rather the consequence of a profit-seeking entity cutting as many corners as possible to get their ship across the local group. However odd these little features are, they seem absolutely justified within the universe, and you must work through these spaces chunk by chunk, deck by deck, in your detailed campaign to wrestle control of the Von Braun back from the many. And then there's the Rickenbacker, <clears throat> and it sucks. An early sign came when climbing the initial ladder well, and turrets sprang up behind the rungs. The Rickenbacker has three sections, and the first is the biggest, and has the most content. It's also a cramped series of maintenance tunnels, halls, and crawl spaces, with even deadlier turrets around every other corner that will quickly make you dead. You're here to destroy black eggs of an unhatched creature that you cannot defeat, Shodan says. A quest that drags you through all of this wretched space. Also, the map really, really sucks, too. There's also something about Mason acceleration coils that not only blew out a chunk of the ship, but requires you to reverse gravity for the middle section of the ship, a section that sadly does not take advantage of being upside down, except for maybe this church, which is really creepy. And then in the final top section, you're flipped right back up again, which makes this entire Rickenbacker sandwich feel like it was put together in crunch. Not helping was when I tried to just get out of the elevator in the upside down section, and I couldn't. I had to back up and oh. run out the elevator door, okay. but only after seeking Fucking advice tricky. on the internet. But moving through the Rickenbacker, even as I was confined to maintenance areas and a huge chunk of it is blown out, I kept wondering, who the hell would use this ship? In my limitless imagination, I couldn't imagine anyone finding these spaces to be very practical. It actually makes me glad that I didn't make it off the Von Braun in my original playthrough nearly two decades ago, because I know I would have thought a bit less about the game as a whole. That said, as much as I dislike the Rickenbacker section of this game, at least until you get to the bridge, it still streets ahead of the Soul Forge Cathedral level that caps Thief 2, an otherwise brilliant game. And I will fight you on this, again. I do want to highlight the body of the many here, which is the game's most unique level, and also probably its most confusing. Its geometry and undulating textures work just well enough to produce the unsettling notion that you are wandering through a literal biological body. It's not just a confusing space. The chasm leading up to your confrontation with the mind of the many is one of the most frustrating segments I've played in a okay. video game. But it's also really freaking clever and incredibly memorable in good ways as well. The way the level integrates chunks of the Rickenbacker and the Von Braun as it strangles the two ships is such a cool mismatch that it really works. 
Now, before we dive into how System Shock works moment to moment, we have to discuss its base mission as an immersive oh, sim. Okay. To do that, I have to describe what an immersive sim is with the immersive sim kitchen. Having to explain what an immersive sim is for every long video about an immersive sim is kind of exhausting. So I've spent plenty of time here on this analogy that I hope to pull this off one final time and just be good forever. You are playing a game in a kitchen full of tools and ingredients, far more than you would probably ever see or use outside of a restaurant. With this kitchen, you can use the tools and ingredients in such a way that you can make practically any dish. The ingredients are designed to work together exactly as they would in real life. If you found a recipe on the real world internet for a cake, then threw together the virtual ingredients and tossed it into the virtual oven for a real amount of time, it would become a good tasting virtual cake as well, judged by some kind of algorithm within the game. The oven would calculate the physics on the molecules of the batter you made, the batter that it calculated from the mixture and ingredient of molecules from the ingredients that you made, and in the end, the game would know that you had made a cake. If you make the recipe wrong, the game knows the cake will fail to grow, or it'll taste weird or bad. You have scads of ingredients to make virtually any dish you want, so if you want to make a pasta, cook a steak, or make a cheesecake, you can do all of this. Now by itself, this is an interesting toy. The game is simulating very complex interactions and it's immersive because you can summon objectives in your imagination and convert them directly to things you can do in the game. But this also isn't much of a game because there aren't any objectives. There is no beginning outside of when you enter the kitchen and there is no end beyond quitting the game. So now we put a frame around this. Suppose that before you're in this kitchen, you've just gone on a date, potentially hit it off, which is its own set of simulations, and you've invited them over for dinner the following evening. Just like the real world, you'd have to ask what their dietary preferences are, if they have any allergies, so forth. You don't have all the time in the world to get this done because you also have to work a day job. You have to grab a vital package from the post office, etc. So now you're back in the immersive sim kitchen with an idea about what to make, but aren't quite sure how. If you make the meal successfully to their liking, you get to go on another date. If you don't, the relationship is effectively over. What we've done here is now cranked up the number of games and simulations within this immersive sim kitchen game to replicate reality. We are given an even greater opportunity to integrate our imagination to problem solve, while the game colonizes more of our thought process as we prod out the rules of the game, rather than abiding by the strict objectives of the game designer. Heck, if you screw up a main course half an hour before the date is set to arrive, you might have enough time to still hit up a virtual DoorDash for takeout. This simulation can then expand into nearly infinity as you spend time out in the virtual world promoting your cooking and new recipes at trade shows, even winning over the royal family with your immersive sim kitchen. This game is so complex and so complete that you can take what you learn here as a virtual chef and actually become a star chef in the real world as well. The what I've described is, in effect, the perfect immersive sim. It's not hard to imagine how many expansions you could expand this into, whether you go from a virtual toddler to an elderly person, whether your time secretly tinkering with your dad's truck while he's at work land you a career as a Formula One driver years later. It's the perfect game altogether, too, the dream stuff of Peter Molyneux. But this game doesn't exist for a variety of logistical reasons. There isn't enough hardware in the universe to calculate all these possibilities and simulate all of these interactions. There is no way to effectively bug test a game with infinite potential. There's no way to produce a game that relies on nearly perfect information. This is, in effect, the kind of action that an immersive sim chases. So how do immersive sims exist then? For one, their scope is far more limited and tied to a pre-existing narrative and three-act structure or four-act structure that makes stories work. For two, they cheat. Thief gives you a variety of ways to infiltrate the Ramirez Manor and a number of tools to do it, but you can't move on until you complete your predetermined objectives. What if Garrett doesn't want to humiliate Ramirez after his goons try to assassinate you? Deus Ex fakes the illusion of choice by providing so many inputs and outputs, then stringing them to events that happen later on, generating the notion that you're affecting the world through your own actions as the player, something that other games in the series don't really cash in on. Doug Church once famously called System Shock an inch wide and a mile deep, and Deus Ex a mile wide and an inch deep. System Shock lets you do many, many things, like annihilate mankind accidentally. 
but you're stuck in the 10 levels of Citadel Station. Deus Ex lets you go many places and interact with many characters, but the decisions you made were not very complex and neither were their consequences. Church then speculated that he'd love to see a game that was both a mile wide and a mile deep. That game is the immersive sim kitchen. It's the dream of virtual reality, of Mark Zuckerberg and Meta, of Snow Crash, of so much science fiction. For the sake of this review, that must eventually conclude, it's the dream of System Shock as well. Both System Shock games are immersive sims, but they're very different philosophically. System Shock 2 is a relatively streamlined and user-friendly game that not only enjoys the quality of life improvements that came out of the late 90s, but it intentionally limits your choices as to not overwhelm you. Despite being nearly a quarter of a century old now, modern immersive sims share its somewhat streamlined sensibilities, which has allowed the game to age gracefully compared to its predecessor. The first game, however, chases the purity of the immersive sim kitchen and thinks in a scale that is far larger and open-ended. That Shodan isn't as intimidating in the first game is kind of irrelevant because the game chases a mechanical high rather than a narrative-based experiential one like its successor under Levine's script and direction. There's a pen and paper feel to System Shock, and it's not hard to imagine slowing the game just a little bit further and turning it into a one-on-one -on -one affair against the DM behind a privacy screen. Because of the game's lower fidelity presentation, there are even HUD indicators letting you know that you've actually hit an enemy, or that you're actually accomplishing any damage based on the kind of weapon you're using, similar to how a DM would confirm your damage in a pen and paper session. When System Shock was early in development, Looking Glass considered setting their game in the modern day, but then they would have had to have realistic amounts of contemporary objects to interact with, and the suspension of disbelief required would have been far too great. That didn't stop Looking Glass from employing a kitchen sink approach by providing you many undocumented tools to achieve solutions on your own, many tools you may never use. You have a headlamp you can equip to see in the dark, but also night vision, and then also illuminating cyber drugs. You have tons of software you can pick up with upgraded versions the further up in the station you go. Every single panel and object in the game has an identification tag, and usually something to say when you're trying to use it. In a way, it felt like Scribblenauts, a puzzle platformer series that debuted on the Nintendo DS that let you summon nearly any object you could think of to solve puzzles. System Shock really wants you to think about the possibilities of the space so that you can solve important quests or objectives on your own, like, you know, finding buttons. The idea that you have so much agency and ability to manipulate the environment in ways that were emergent or dynamic really primed the player on the idea that there was rarely any single answer to any problem at any time, even if there were fixed scenarios that required specific solutions. The sequel? Uh, not so much. In chasing its own immersive sim kitchen dreams and replicating the nuance and possibility of the real world, it contextualized having very detail-oriented levels, despite their primitive graph paper layouts or the obtuseness of the objectives. Imagine you were tasked with working on a real Citadel station you had never been on before and were assigned to insert a component into a particular cabinet. These days, games would have an arrow guiding you from point to point, or the objective or level's layout would be simplified to make it easier to find. This is conceptually a very dad game through and through. It's a game that requires you to pay very close attention and do your homework. This game really is designed to be work at times, with the payoff being some truly immersive experiences that you can claim a lot of ownership of. But... The game isn't exactly handing out ribbons for figuring it out, so you rarely feel properly rewarded for accomplishing things. In fact, the designers seem to take on a gleeful malice about making some of your tasks as obfuscated as possible. That cabinet you need to find? Good luck. <laughs> There's a diagram you can find that outlines exactly where it's at, except it overlays the four quadrants of the maintenance level hell maze over each other, leaving you to wander through them potentially again, like I did, trying to find this very particular cabinet to slide this vital component into. I mentioned earlier the sprints between elevators when you're low on health or ammo, but then there's this point most of the way through where I need to blow up the station's four antenna. I don't realize that I need to pry off this specific panel at the base of the pedestal, then drag the plastic explosive onto the exposed electronics. Why would Citadel's technicians not provide explicit instructions about this stuff? And while there are absolutely negatives to this approach, especially in the lens of how modern games are designed and experienced, 
guiding you along a little too tightly at times and removing a ton of your agency, even with my stumbles in System Shock, it was refreshing to have such an immersive sim kitchen experience sandbox to play in. In fact, I'd love to see a newer, much higher fidelity game that chases that dream, and maybe isn't a horror game. Even Deus Ex feels like a walk in the park compared to this game. This is simply a different kind of play, and it's completely understandable why a niche of nerdy gamers would enjoy this kind of game-as-work approach in much the same way that people spend years becoming competitive speed cubers. You may not be getting a dopamine hit every few minutes, but the larger payoffs, less frequent payoffs, are worth it. Like its sequel, and unlike Thief, there's really no way to play stealthily in this game. You can run past enemies to an extent, but these levels are so constrictive and unreliably safe that it's impossible to avoid violent confrontation entirely. There will be no pacifist runs in here. In that regard, this is where the shotgun approach of the Deus Ex series succeeds in the kitchen. You can stealth if you want to stealth, fight if you want to fight, talk if you don't want to do either, hack if you don't want to do any of those, and those options are usually available in all scenarios. System Shock mandates fighting and puzzle solving to some extent, but provides a variety of tools to do so. It seems impossible to paint yourself into a corner abilities-wise and unable to finish the game, unlike the sequel, because the game provides all of the tools you need if you simply seek them out. This is why it's also not an RPG, but we'll talk about that more when we get to the sequel. Seamus Blackley's physics contributions to the game are felt everywhere. There's a lot of skidding, sliding, and bouncing, plus some skates you can pick up that never felt quite right and then I didn't use them. It makes tossing items realistic and creates the strong suggestion that you're in lower gravity. There are times where it feels that you're actually an operating human robot that moves with one leg in front of the other, shifting its weight realistically, which can make things like the platforming awkward as fuck compared to its contemporaries. Contemporaries that still, sadly, embraced first-person platforming. The sequel dodges these jumping puzzles for the most part, but not quite all the way. There's even this ski ramp area in storage that makes absolutely no sense except to show off the game's physics capabilities. It's pretty freaking cool. Preceding Arma by year, System Shock also rather unnecessarily offers you a variety of ways to displace your body. You can crouch, but you can also go prone. In any of these three stages, you can also lean from side to side. It's definitely a mechanic in search of a use case that I only really activated by accident, and you'll use it pretty much exclusively for getting in and out of vents. It gets parred down to pretty much just a crouch and leaning in successive games, and then pretty much just crouching with third person mechanics by the time Human Revolution showed up. I believe this was all for the better. But this is all burying the lead. System Shock is hard to play. For all of the functionality and potential and sandboxiness that System Shock presents, playing it is best described as cognitively difficult and intimidating. It's like playing a space-based Deus Ex with a crane game machine. It would be very easy to see screenshots of System Shock in the mid-90s and believe it was a fast-paced Doom clone, which was a common label for any first-person shooter released around that time. But those gamers would be in for an incredible surprise. Like its contemporaries, System Shock featured a very granular difficulty setting, a kind of hedge against any component of the game being too much or too little for gamers. I initially went with a 2 setting across the board, but then reset with a 1 in combat because I felt it was just overwhelming. And if you're wondering, as I did, what a more difficult story is, well, it adds a time limit. Speedrunners only, I guess. But now, we have to talk about the interface which clearly predates and possibly inspires every single quality of life improvement that followed. No doubt every immersive sim after this, including its sequel, based their user interface and experience on large part on not replicating this game's chunky experiment. Even the remake sheds most of the game's interface and still functionally accomplishes nearly everything just the same. Fun fact! Looking Glass designers had to fight to get this single panel splash screen included at the beginning of the game to provide any kind of context of how System Shock's interface worked beyond the manual. Do you remember manuals? System Shock employs a two-stage interface. One steers your cursor like any first-person shooter and allows you to aim and shoot. The second interface turns your reticle into a mouse cursor and allows you to pick things up, select things, access panels, solve puzzles, click on buttons, open and close doors, and otherwise interact with the environment, or your interface. Now games still have two-stage interfaces, but they integrate nearly all of the interactivity into the firing mode. 
For the secondary interface, they typically pause the game and take up the entire screen so that you can do all the character and mission and inventory management you could possibly want with a full screen map. System Shock wanted you to access as much of this information as possible without leaving the immersion of the game. But we need to contextualize this because it truly is an incredible experiment for the sake of the game's ambition. This interface is modular with three different panels along the bottom 30% of the screen that you can change to your liking. You can have each panel be different or you can have multiple panels be the same thing, if you're a weirdo. There's no way to create presets, however, so when a new tool or event takes over different panels of your interface, you'll have to reset them manually. If you are so unfortunate to have to play the original game in 320x200, as mentioned earlier, expect to have your style cramped trying to make out details. Despite featuring a control scheme that dominates the keyboard, System Shock demands constant mouse engagement to accomplish virtually anything. It was difficult to play System Shock for more than about an hour and a half with how many decisions and double clicks you have to make. This game seriously may as well have an APM counter in the corner. The sequel was hard to play for longer than two hour stints unless I was streaming it and chatting with friends, but that was because it was just scarier. You don't even get a mouse look unless you mod it in or play the enhanced edition, so you have to use the keyboard to look up and down or click your view up and down in the top control, same with the stances right next to it. What would become part of the mouse control was stuck on the keyboard. What would become keyboard bindings required a mouse. It truly is a worst of both worlds experience that was pretty common in the era, but not quite to this complexity. Grabbing and using the game's many, many objects requires many double click and click drag release actions versus the simple right clicks of successive games. The cognitive load adds up very quickly in this game. While other reviewers were interested in playing this game with the full cyber carapace paneling and the view in a smaller window in the top half, Doug Church says you should actually play this full screen, as I did here, so that you're never taken out of the experience. Nearly all information is available at all times in full screen without ruining the immersion, and there's a purity to this approach. Unfortunately, there's no stamina meter in full screen, so you only get tiny text warnings after a sprint. Then again, it doesn't really matter all that much. Another vital fixture in this game that doesn't quite make it to the sequel are the flight sim-esque cyberspace sequences. The idea of diving into a virtual space via special terminals to accomplish objectives and gain items and credentials is really cool. That said, it's not a very cool experience. Even with most of the mechanics and interface stripped away, you're floating through a confusing wireframe space with abstract enemies and even more abstract pickups and power-ups. It's easy to get lost in cyberspace because even as the game lights up chamber faces to indicate that you can't fly through them, it doesn't do this regularly enough to give you a sturdy indication of these chambers' shapes and sizes. Apparently they recognized this in development and inserted large 3D arrows to help you out as well. Irrational recognized the frailty of these sections and only included them in a limited format for the opening tutorials and then entwined with reality in the march to Shodan at the end. But the real triumph here is in how Night Dive revisited them for the remake. It's still easy to get lost wondering what to do, but holy cow, these are spaces that Lisa Frank could draw inspiration from. These are the most colorful spaces in the entire demo, and they gave me flashbacks to Lawnmower Man's extensive CGI sequences, which was contemporary to the original game. Terrible movie, but I mean, you could definitely see the comparisons here between Lawnmower Man's Cyber God and Shodan. System Shock also employs a cast of cyber drugs to temporarily enhance your abilities in different ways. As we saw earlier, Berserk enhances your melee and your visual space with a look that screams, your video card is on fire. Reflex slows down time and looks like an error, like your computer is leaking memory and is rendering incorrectly. I bring these up not just because the idea is pretty cool, or because I need to copyright the term cyber drugs, but because using multiple drugs at once is kind of a visual and mechanical nightmare. Like, hey, here's me popping non-dermal patches, something that is modeled very well in the remake, so I can murder Edward Diego here, and upon his death even more baddies spawn. This was initially difficult, so I took some drugs and killed the baddies, but then the game keeps going, and so do the drugs, and you kinda wonder if it's still the drugs in effect, or if the game has genuinely broken. When I think about it though, not knowing when these drugs will wear off is probably the most cyberpunk thing ever. Throughout the game you'll acquire abilities via software and hardware that are just out in the environment to collect. 
Remember, acquiring nearly all of these abilities is just a matter of exploration, rather than a choice to specialize. Again, headlamps, skates, jump jets, and more are available to you, and while there are some standalone skills upgrades in the sequel, they render nearly all of these standalone kits obsolete through quality of life improvements or aesthetic choices. Everything else in the sequel must go through the module system, which we'll get to. So now we have combat, and in System Shock there are so, so many weapons. You can pick up any gun or melee weapon without needing to invest talent points to use it. Because of the interface and the varieties of ammo types for each weapon, reloading is a pain. Rather than mapping reload to a simple keyboard binding like every other game in the universe, they open the possibility to you, any time you want to reload, that maybe you want to switch the kind of ammo you're loading. This then burdens you with the extra choice every single time of what ammo you want to load into your weapon. And of course this usually happens in the midst of a confrontation. System Shock does not give an F about its cognitive demands of the player. But with the number of options the game gives you, it also gives you plenty of opportunities to use them all, like grenades. I rarely used mines or proximity rounds in either game, because I died a lot walking into my own traps. Like the Max Payne games, System Shock offers plenty of ammo, but they might not be for the weapons you anticipate. So your favorite weapons in this game tend to be the ones you have and have ammo for. Because of the game's sprite-based enemies, it can be difficult to determine hitboxes, hence the necessity for the interface to provide hit indications, especially when shooting from above. And remember, there is no directional damage indicator, or usually any sounds, so you need to be very cautious when ammo starts flying. Speaking of which, there are cyborg assassins in both games that toss out ninja stars, and these are very... inspired enemies. Above all, I enjoyed the combat in System Shock over its sequel because the game relies on combat and the game knows that. So once you've gained access to the game's complete weaponry, you typically have a combat-based solution to any problem. There are at least three badass weapons you acquire by the game's third act that make you feel truly powerful and it feels really good. And this ultimately aids in making the game easier to play over time. There was a point at least halfway through where I felt I had a grasp on things and my cognitive resources could focus on what I needed to do instead of how I could move and manipulate this mech of an interface to get things done. Of course, as soon as I got to that point, the game started to ramp up the difficulty again to take advantage of my newfound confidence as it wound down to a conclusion. So now we come to System Shock 2, and again, it's not a surprise that the quality of life improvements streamlined the gameplay considerably. As a result, this game became a bigger, easier entry point for gamers into the series, like me. Warren Spector called System Shock 2, a game he didn't have any creative control over, much more of a traditional role-playing game than the first one. Which is something that will make sense again when we talk about modules and skills in a bit. The game reduces the cognitive load on the player by not inviting you to pay attention to everything in the environment via the interface. Most objects in these levels won't give you a readout or ID tag if you hover over it, but that's not to say there are fewer things to interact with. System Shock 2 isn't interested in letting you explore infinite possibilities when they're finite. It doesn't want you to spend so much time pondering what you ultimately can't do. To that end, where System Shock provides you nearly everything you need and a little more to accomplish your goals, minus the helpful interface needed to do so efficiently, the sequel is focused on scarcity and giving you just enough to get by, which is common in more traditional horror games. But where System Shock 2 is less ambitious in trying to create the immersive sim kitchen experience, it is absolutely easier to play and understand. The game doesn't dump everything on you at once with a cheesy help screen and a minor tutorial. Playing the first game first all the way through before sinking into the sequel, it almost feels like cheating to play a game that so ingeniously fixes that game's interface in ways that nearly every subsequent game takes advantage of. This game even adds new mechanics and makes them easier to use, which makes them more intuitive, which reduces the cognitive load on the player. That is, until the game needs you to do a lot of things very quickly in stressful situations throughout, but especially in the end. The opening sequence is a much better introduction overall. You arrive via subway just outside the UNN Recruitment Center ready to enlist, and you don't have to worry about your UI or shooting or anything. You can wander around, take a look at spilled garbage, absorb the local flavor, before diving into a pretty extensive but intuitive series of tutorials in cyberspace. You inevitably choose your branch of service and pick a series of tours that take you to service on the Von Braun, commanded directly from William Bedford Diego, all of which determines the weapons and skills you start the game with. 
This entire opening sequence comes just five years after designers begged for a single help screen in the first game to explain things. System Shock 2 also features a dual stage interface, but as we explored earlier, it offloads a lot of the world interaction to the firing view and saves the inventory research and the log view for the secondary interface that's very fast and easy to get in and out of. It seems that everything in the sequel requires half as many actions and clicks, or fewer. Ironically, with a less open-ended design and a more thoughtful user experience, I felt more immersed in the world of the Von Braun and the Rickenbacker, even if I ultimately had fewer options. It's like running around the world with thinner gloves to feel more things. And just a quick note on the removal of all that posturing stuff in the first game, this game convinced me of the value of leaning when literally no other immersive sim had done it before. So now we get to the skills and modules, finally. The sequel's largest change to gameplay. Let's go back to that immersive sim kitchen. In its default state, the game hands you a recipe card, the ingredients and tools you need, and success relies on execution. Get more recipes, execute them better, you improve as a player, and again, you may improve as a chef in the real world. That's the immersion that System Shock and even the Thief series chase. But imagine you could upgrade your kitchen and skills through game mechanics. Imagine you could buy a new oven that baked cake 10% faster that was 10% better, which impressed your guests or customers 20% better. Imagine you could buy a cookbook that made you 20% better at making Mexican dishes that opened up your commercial opportunities. The default kitchen's results rely on how well you execute with your existing skills. This kitchen's results rely on abstractions, on the gear and assets you've acquired, rather than how well you actually execute the recipe. Philosophically, this is similar to the roguelike versus roguelite debate. Roguelikes don't get easier as you play them, you simply get better at playing them. Roguelites allow you to accumulate points to make the game easier, independent of how well you play the game. This is where Warren Spector compared the sequel to a role-playing game. As you make your way through the game, explore the ships, and achieve storyline objectives, Shodan, or Shodan as Dr. Polito, will transfer cybernetic modules to you that serve as points to invest in the four different tech trees. Based on the choices you made before landing your tour on the Von Braun, you will already have chunks of your character sculpted and skills picked. The Navy will give you more tech skills, the Marines will give you more weapon skills, the OSI more psi skills. Since Immersive Sims followed this branch of evolution rather than the original games, Immersive Sims both mechanically and interface-wise feel a lot like this and the full-blown role-playing games of the Bethesda variety. There are many, many things you can accomplish without at least putting a few points into them. Unlocking doors, hacking replicators, repairing and maintaining weapons, expanding your inventory, researching alien artifacts, on and on, are genuinely not possible without some kind of module investment. Coming off the first game, it was weird going from having to solve a puzzle to unlock a bridge to not being able to get into a room at all. As you reach the mid-game, you will absolutely struggle as you encounter more and more scenarios you cannot engage because you simply don't have the talents to do so. Some talents work together, like hacking and cyber affinity, which both make hacking easier and more likely. So what do you put points into, and what has to be sacrificed in turn? These decisions, these character builds, are tough to formulate as a new player, but obviously easier if you're a super fan with existing preferences. Now there's nothing inherently wrong about any of these approaches, especially since one clearly won out culturally over the other. These are simply different kinds of play. Over the past 20 years, you'll find examples of hybrid approaches like in the Elder Scrolls where using a skill increases it. This lets System Shock 2 feel more familiar to modern gaming audiences, but it also very easily allows you to paint yourself into a corner with a bad build, unable to continue. This is especially true in alliance with the game's economy, which is another new feature the sequel introduces. The game tries to rectify this by dumping plenty of modules on you by the time you leave the Von Braun, but there are so many possibilities and high-end skills that are so expensive that if you don't specialize, you will not only ruin your character, but ice yourself out of a whole bunch of other options and different kinds of gameplay as well. Any attempts to become a jack-of-all-trades skills-wise, even in the late game, are also not advisable, especially since you can't respec your character or any individual skill trees. This entire approach fits perfectly into a coordinated co-op playthrough though, where each player can specialize their skills knowing that someone else is covering where they're not, but we'll come back to that. 
The levels of System Shock 2 are smaller, tighter, and more sensical than the first games. This time around you have notes and mission objectives to keep track of your progress so you're not out scouring the world looking for clues as to what to do next. Helping things out are the fact that the ship is a more linear shape and the levels are more linear, but not entirely so from a gameplay perspective. The game kind of compensates for this by including a heck of a lot of backtracking to advance the narrative. At the same time, there are chunks you can skip with privileged information at the expense of potential resources. I could skip this entire stressful sequence wandering through the Von Braun's cargo bays to acquire a single key code by simply reloading with the knowledge of the key code in my physical worldly brain, which saved me a lot of death and nanites. It's absolutely interesting to consider that Levine originally wanted an extravehicular activity sequence in which you moved between the ships via their exterior rather than the hidden lift. Clearly this was beyond the technical abilities of the Dark Engine. Security in the sequel matters in a huge way. Cameras have an actual use and can be destroyed for real reasons rather than merely chipping away at a level's variable. Those familiar with Bioshock will be absolutely familiar with this functionality, in which cameras rotate with vision cones and if they lock onto you for too long, they sound the level's alarm, which causes the game to spawn more enemies to deal with you. This is particularly stressful here as any enemy encounter is a guaranteed loss of resources when you may not have them to begin with. Security systems can be hacked at specific terminals at the cost of nanites if you have the appropriate skills and this gives you a few minutes to wander around and dispatch cameras or just not get caught unseen. Two decades ago this would have been an automatic do whenever I found a terminal, but nowadays a few pistol rounds on an errant camera eliminates a lot of stress. This only really fell through when a camera had spotted me that I couldn't find. Finding an errant camera when it did go off followed by a quick load to destroy it quickly became my MO. This game has no energy or control to force you to live by your mistakes. Still, there's no sense as you destroy cameras that you're actually shutting down the menis or Shodan's perception of you either here or on Citadel. I mean, it can't send minions after you if you destroy their sensors, but both big bads can still communicate with you directly. Neither game really creates the idea that any area is truly safe or free from respawning enemies or off limits to the series villainy, which makes the games still feel very gamey. Also new to System Shock 2 is research. You will find plenty of artifacts like the many's right. organs or weaponry that you can research to increase the effectiveness of your own attacks against specific enemies or allow you to use new implants that allow you to swallow worms to replenish your health. This research will require the use of specific chemicals and, of course, a high enough research skill depending on the artifact. Each level will have its own selection of chemicals thankfully documented in downloadable records and Shodan, I mean Dr. Polito, warned you about loading up on chemicals and wandering through these decks with them clogging up your inventory. But at some point you are going to have to fight enemies and System Shock 2 has some thoughts on combat, which I have conveniently ordered into pros and cons. Pros, it's much easier to play. You reload with the R key, you switch ammo and firing modes with the V key. It's quick and easy like every other modern shooter compared to the bulky tank-like reloading style of the first game. In fact, it's so quick and easy that it's actually misleading. Crafting the notion that it's the default response to any confrontation when you never have the resources to respond this way consistently. But combat also feels more visceral here, especially the melee, because of the legitimate 3D environment with 3D enemies, which works out great because the game's more confined spaces require it far more often, although trying to knock out cameras with your wrench feels just as awkward as ever. There are respawn stations here yet again, but as mentioned earlier, they come with a cost, something that adds an inevitable failure state when you are stuck without nanites to respawn and are forced to reload from a harder save. It's an odd compromise design-wise because you include respawn stations to avoid the penalties of having to reload, but then require people to reload after an arbitrary number of failures anyway. If only to prevent the kind of respawn abuse that mitigated the point of med packs and healing beds in the first game. There's a reason why Irrational's next game turn off respawn costs again. As a reminder that this is the late 90s, you can acquire absolutely massive weaponry that takes up a huge chunk of your screen estate, you know, to inform you that it's powerful. While this sequel doesn't feature directional damage indicators either, the enemy's bolts tend to discharge as slow projectiles that you can dodge. Except those cyborg midwives, because holy shit. 
but then cons, and I realize I've already acknowledged a few of these, but whatever, I make the rules here. Weapons are plenty available, but ammo is not. In fact, weapons are so available that all of the weapons you find on the bipedal hybrids that were once your crewmates are jammed because you'd have so, so many live weapons otherwise that it would mitigate the point of repairing and maintaining your guns. When you finally acquire weaponry you enjoy, however, you won't find that much ammo for it. You share ammo between the pistol and the assault rifle, and so the one time I used the latter's automatic mode, I not only missed my target, but I rendered two of my most important weapons useless. You can thankfully recharge energy weapons at convenient fonts throughout the ship, but they aren't very useful against organic enemies like these goddamn spiders. There's more of an urgency to scrounge for resources than ever in this game, and there are fewer of them. Your weapons break down, and they'll break down often, and at exactly the wrong moments. If you don't have a good repair skill, you better hope to find the game's standalone repair tools, because you use weaponry far too often to let it fall apart. If you want to avoid the repair fire break loop, you can use the game's limited number of maintenance tools to improve their condition, which comes in 10 different shades, but only if you've put points towards your maintenance skill. Can you see how easily the early and mid game can be frustrating when it comes to combat systems you rely on without the necessary skills to sustain them? And then, however rarely it happened, it was possible to be killed next to the respawn machine, which resurrects you with minimal health, and get spawn killed by whatever you just killed you over and over. It's great. The first game avoids this by keeping you in a cage when you respawn until you voluntarily decide to leave. Piling on top of this is the game's economy, and nanites serve as your currency. Now there's a whole video that I will probably never make about economies and games, but introducing money into an immersive sim can really feel like getting gift cards for Christmas instead of the things that you actually wanted, that you put into a list maybe, a numbered list, based on priority. But no big deal. No, no big deal. Money exists in other immersive sims like Deus Ex, but it's in a place to open opportunities rather than serve as the lifeblood of your progress. System Shock 2 still distributes goods like ammo and weaponry and health refilling snacks throughout the levels or on bad guys, but the in-game economy gives the game a reason to drop currency as well. It also gives the game a reason to install vending machines to spend these nanites, devices that clearly precede the wacky vendors of Bioshock. But money doesn't make a whole lot of sense in this world, because there's no other person on the other side to benefit from the transaction. You're buying from machines. Machines don't care about money. This leads me to believe that nanites are actually some kind of battery that gets used to generate the product or service because you use nanites to heal and respawn as well. But then, you can hack into these vending machines to make items cheaper. So does the machine somehow figure out how to generate the item for less energy? Are you getting an inferior good when you hack the vending machine and pay for something? Or maybe the vending machine was always saving some of these nanites in some kind of energy bank where, and of course this entire system in which you pay for everything in the game becomes incredibly stressful as that nanite count approaches zero. But it'll rarely reach zero. It'll always be an amount small enough to stop your progress cold. Moving between these two games, remember the first game features no money or economy whatsoever, it almost feels like a faint criticism of unfettered capitalism altogether. Here you sacrifice some necessities for the freedom to gamble for them back with a stockpile of arbitrarily valued and acquired currency. When you run out of it, you're kicked out to the main menu. The game attempts to provide some economic control with the Recycler, a device you can purchase to convert items including plenty of set dressing and jammed shotguns directly to nanites when the game is simply not handing out nanites on its own. Unfortunately, this is a low yield device, distributing about a single nanite for every item you recycle. Even with the safety net that playing cooperatively provides, I don't think I've recovered the recycler's purchase price. I toss around the term economy charitably though. This is an almost entirely closed system, and even with the recycler and respawning enemies, you will inevitably run out of resources to proceed. You are merely converting ammo into dead enemies and other tools into weapon health and otherwise, so you may continue to spend ammo on those enemies. I say this all in advance of my confession. Before you can get off the Von Braun, you need to hack a vending machine to create a thingy to blow up a shuttle that the many is trying to escape on. Well, I'd hacked the vending machine, but didn't have the 80 nanites required to produce the plot device. Not even close. 
I went back through the decks and tried to scrounge for the sum, but I couldn't. Respawning enemies weren't putting out nanites, so I was in fact losing money wandering around trading ammo for alien organs I'd researched long ago. The only real option was to probably reload a save from an age ago and avoid some purchases so that I could wind up with 80 nanites by this point in the campaign. Or I could just cheat. So I did. Summoning big nanite piles, which were only 50 each via the console, not only allowed me to get off the Von Braun, but most of the way through the Rickenbacker as well, with its hoary surprises and frequent regeneration fees. Even as I summoned more nanites, I never felt like I was at an advantage. It always felt like I was plugging a deficit. Doing this versus even more rigorous saves coming, I felt justified in my decision. I can understand how longtime fans will be able to avoid this entire mess with optimized character builds, favorable inventories, and plenty of other memorized min-maxing. But as a first and a half time player, it seemed like a valid tactic just to complete the game. And then, at last, we have the sequel's cooperative mode, brought to life by my pal Orzine. These days, Ken Levine regrets the fact that Irrational spent so much time to get its four-player cooperative mode working, when they could have really buffed up that third act of the campaign as a single-player experience. Co-op wasn't even ready at release, it was patched in later, and it, uh, is still absolutely unfinished and janky AF. First off, it took some time to get set up, involving extra tunneling software and drivers because this was a game that came out when people bringing their beige towers and heavy monitors to the same carpeted basement for LAN parties was still a thing. With the open-ended nature of the levels and amount of sheer gameplay involved, effective communication is mandatory. It's easy for players to run off on their own and for everyone involved to lose track of who's done what, who's taken care of what room, who's raided what lockers, picked up what logs, and acquired what information. And then there are absolutely bugs. Laughable bugs, incredible wondrous bugs. Your co-op partner regularly T-poses and dives into the ground, swimming away like a fish before being restored to our plane of reality. Enemies killed by your partner will simply freeze in the air and they'll T-pose too. While Orzine has experienced successful co-op playthroughs in the past, our run was eventually ground to a halt by script-breaking issues that prevented us from moving further beyond that 80 nanite replicator goal I mentioned from earlier. Co-op is also pretty fun when it doesn't feel like you're completely breaking the game. This isn't an open world game, so it looks and feels really weird having people zooming around these enclosed spaces, soaking up ammo, money, and medkits like they're candy. I played this with just one other person, I can't imagine what 3 or 4 player co-op looks like. It's probably amazing. Even with another person, however, it can still be difficult to work through some of these sections that will have no problem murdering you over and over. Thankfully, it has an additional mechanic where you can bypass the respawn machine so you can still pop back up even if you're out of nanites. It reduces that stress by a lot. You can also begin to experiment with stuff you probably wouldn't have in the single player, like the fact that smokes replenish your psi meter if you use psionic mental powers, and booze replenishes your health just like in the real world. There's a lot about this game's cooperative mode that doesn't feel balanced and clearly wrong, so I wouldn't recommend it for a first run to truly appreciate this game. If I can tough out the single player with, uh, a little help, I know you can too, but it's been almost a quarter of a century since this game came out. What the heck happened to this series? In 2072, a rogue artificial intelligence known as Shodan lost her mind. In her limitless imagination, Shodan saw herself as a goddess, destined to inherit the earth. That image was snuffed out by the hacker who created her. In a deliberate move by Warren Spector designed to protect Looking Glass, despite the fact that he was on publisher EA slash Origins payroll at the time, System Shock's trademark and copyright were split between EA and Looking Glass, whatever that means. While I certainly don't understand the legal aspects of this transaction, because EA kept renewing System Shock's trademark every couple years anyway, it meant that neither party could make a System Shock game without the other party in this special gatekeeper keymaster relationship. In fact, EA's Dead Space was originally intended to be a System Shock continuation, but became an original IP when they couldn't get the rights. When Looking Glass dissolved in 2000, their half of the transaction went to Star Insurance Company, which then held on to the rights to the series for years to follow. The fate of the series looked grim. 
But over a decade later, Stephen Kick and the guys at Night Dive approached Star Insurance with a plan to reissue System Shock 2, and Star signed off, allowing for the game's 2013 reissue. Star eventually sold the entire System Shock property to Night Dive, and with that hot VC money, they were able to reissue other classic games, and then conjure the original System Shock back to life as well. We've talked about all this already. In 2015, Night Dive and developer OtherSide unveiled two new System Shock games. The first was simply called System Shock, Night Dive's complete reboot and reimagining of the original game. The second was a full sequel by OtherSide called System Shock 3. Being built with Unity, System Shock gained traction with a successful Kickstarter campaign in 2016, raising $1.3 million. Night Dive hired writers from Obsidian's Fallout New Vegas to craft a whole new story, and it seemed like the sky was the limit. In 2017, Night Dive switched to Unreal, which gave them more versatility to get the game on multiple platforms. But by 2018, it was clear behind the scenes that they had bitten off far more than they could chew, as scope creep strangled development. The game was put on hold to reevaluate their plans and then retooled to be a remaster of the original game's levels and assets and ideas, rather than something drafted from scratch. That said, it's apparent from the trailers and the medical level demo that it's faithful until it's not, like this very dark preview of the research level, or this new prologue scene from the hacker's apartment, which is fine. I played the original Unity Kickstarter demo when it debuted in 2016, and I went through the whole new demo, which seems to accurately reflect what will come from the final game, and I do uh, have some thoughts on top of what I've already talked about. And bear in mind, these are early days still, and the game still isn't finished. This remake looks pretty, although, again, it's really freaking dark. It's awesome that the puzzles are diegetic, rather than happening in standalone UI windows. They even mixed up the kinds of puzzles, so that's pretty neat. The medical level is faithful to the original and so chock full of detail that it lets you forget that these are still the original primitive grid-based layouts. You may not even notice that these were originally so simple. Removing the big multi-panel modular interface is a relief, animations are sharp and springy, and the melee is... not the greatest. Enemies don't seem to react very well to your gunfire or melee, and that's weird. I'm happy about cyberspace, but I'm not as happy about the lengthy transitions I mentioned earlier. This remake should theoretically be out before the video releases, and I'm actually kind of excited to get my hands on it when I'm not playing the game for the next review. Hey, this is uh, Editor Nick from the future. Actually, it's the past now, now that you're watching it. Night Dive announced that they were partnering with publisher Prime Matter, who uh, was this publisher announced at E3. It's like indie developers. And they also announced that the game is not coming out until 2022. So it will definitely not be out before this review hits the thing. So hey, maybe Stephen Kick can give me review code for this game and I can play it. Okay, thanks, bye. System Shock 3 is being put together by Warren Spector and his team at Other Side Austin, a division of the Boston-based Other Side, founded by Paul Newrath, an arrangement that echoes the Looking Glass Studios arrangement in the mid-90s. Warren skipped the crowdfunding campaign that funded their sister game at Night Dive and entered into a publishing deal with Starbreeze to get System Shock 3 through development. The game was originally pitched as a continuation of System Shock 2, with the six survivors of the Von Braun. You see, after the player protagonist eliminates Shodan and takes control of the two ships, we fade to Tommy Soras and Rebecca Siddons, lovers who manage to escape via the Von Braun's last escape pod. They're about to return the Von Braun after receiving a message from the player protagonist that things are well again. Unfortunately, it looks like after Rebecca was bitten by a spider, something uncovered in an audio log, she somehow contracted a big old case of Shodan Fluenza, at which point we dissolve to Shodan's haunting cackle. This is also the game where we would study Shodan and Edward Diego's motivations in what looked like a time-hopping narrative that would illuminate and contextualize a lot about the existing, now decades-old games. Unfortunately, in another echo of the mid-90s, System Shock 3 ran into trouble. In 2019, Starbreeze announced that it was imploding financially and Other Side was on its own. In fact, Other Side had to buy the rights back to their game from Starbreeze and give back Starbreeze's development investment so far. Afterward, Other Side revealed the first footage of the game. Taken in a vacuum, it looks really good, and the new Shodan is incredible. But if you looked closely, you could see that the trailer took place not after the second game or during the first game, but in a trioptimum black site 12 years after System Shock. When I saw this, I was surprised. 
It soon came out that the game they had been working on and shown off in the trailer was indeed a scaled down version of what they'd initially pitched. After a lot of expensive experimentation that didn't pay off, along with the loss of their publisher's financial support, by the end of 2019 most of the System Shock 3 team had been laid off without any announcement. Clearly the trailer had been put together as a kind of portfolio piece to show off the game for potential investors. Jason Trier's book, Press Reset, describes what happened here in more detail as he writes about Spectre's bumpy ride moving from game to game and dealing with publishers or trying to find cash to get games made. By the end of 2019, Other Side Austin was running out of money and Spectre needed to plug the hole, choosing to take the roadshow route and pitch the game to various publishers. In 2020, one finally bit, Tencent who acquired the rights to System Shock 3 and any future sequels, independent of Night Dive's work on their remake. The working arrangement now that Other Side Austin is little more than a skeleton crew is still unknown over a year and a half since the arrangement was announced, and we haven't heard anything about the sequel since. Oh, uh, there's actually a third System Shock game in the works, an enhanced edition of System Shock 2, this one at Night Dive as well. We don't know much of anything about it, except that it'll be ported into Night Dive's internal Kex engine, similar to their System Shock Source Port Enhanced Edition, and feature VR support. Rumors of an enhanced co-op or anything of the sort have been just that, but it's supposed to debut alongside their System Shock remake and will be free if you purchase that game. Malone's dead. I was just talking to him and this cyborg came up behind him and... Okay, Connie, get a grip. Get a grip. I've recoded to my surprise, playing these games in their entirety changed my mind on both. System Shock has infamously been an unapproachable game, despite how important it's been to the modern immersive sim. To borrow from Raoul Duke, System Shock is a game that is too weird to live and too rare to die. A challenge of an artifact that beckons you to open your mind and accept its trials on its terms, rather than anything you may be prepared for as a gamer. System Shock 2 feels like comfort food in comparison. Again, it feels like a contemporary game. Coming off Deus Ex Human Revolution, System Shock 2 may feel a little spare. The presentation may be a bit outdated, but you can clearly see the parallels. It has also, for more than 20 years, been a stressful game that scared the hell out of me, something that has not changed at all. But, and I say this knowing it'll be a controversial take, I actually enjoy the first game more for its sheer ambition, for how much it chases the immersive sim kitchen dream. System Shock and its sequel have opposite problems. The first game has more interesting gameplay, but the sequel has a far more dramatic and intriguing storyline scribed by Ken Levine, the guy who would enchant the world with a couple Bioshock games before, well, pretty much disappearing in any official capacity since. Playing Bioshock in 2007 when it came out, a game I didn't like to play all that much, I realized the reason why was because I'd played System Shock 2. Similarly, it turns out there is a small group of gamers who didn't like System Shock 2 all that much because they'd played and loved the original System Shock. For them, the sequel lacked critical aspects that they enjoyed in the first game that the sequel trimmed out for clarity. In either of these scenarios, the earlier game becomes an impenetrable monolith for most people, despite the treasures hidden inside, and now I understand why. Irrational's Bioshock is an incredibly polished but streamlined version of System Shock 2, and playing it recently for my 24-hour fundraising stream, I realized that despite its incredible production values and irresistibly unique Randian narrative, I still didn't enjoy playing it that much. I enjoyed each set piece and destination and cutscene, but the entire game part to get between them? Yeah. Respawning enemies, cramped and confusing level layouts, irritating security systems, I did not enjoy them in the slightest. Even further having beaten the game, it was frustrating to see Bioshock run through the same story beats as System Shock 2, with its single big reveal with its less enticing gameplay, and ultimately see itself far more copies and be promoted far more when System Shock 2 deserved that attention in the late 90s and didn't receive it. The reveal of Fontaine as Atlas was nowhere near as powerful as the reveal of Polito as Shodan, whether you'd played the first System Shock or not. System Shock 2 didn't have the beautiful swim from the sinking plane, but would you kindly was nothing like having a malevolent AI inside your head taunting you. 
With Bioshock Infinite, I remember enjoying it most of the series, because Levine's story ideas were given literally more air, including trippy trans-dimensional gameplay and dream logic. Again, there were definitely chunks of this game that were miserable to play, that felt like some kind of obligation to pad out the game's length. The Infinite that shipped really felt like it missed out on the big immersive sim kitchen potential that its early trailers teased. I'm cautiously optimistic about the future of System Shock, but I'm also cautiously... Uh, cautious. In a world where we enshrine our favorite media with quality of life improvements, the System Shock remake feels like a breath of fresh air, because I haven't spent the past 30 years praising the original game's victories and memorizing level layouts. I'm even excited to see what comes of the System Shock 2 Enhanced Edition and the refinements that they introduce to make the game far more fair and focus it further still. Most importantly, I really want to see System Shock 3 under the supervision of above-the-line talent that designed the original game. Under Tencent's management, I hope it doesn't bend to the needs of commerce and become an even smaller, more streamlined experience that excises its connections to the original games that not nearly enough people have played. I have far more questions than answers about these three new projects at this point, but being able to sit down for this review, I really feel a far greater understanding of how the modern immersive sim came about, its ancestry, and its bleed over into other modern games. Most importantly though, we need new games that are as ambitious as when Church, Spectre, Grossman, and New Wrath sat down long before Citadel Station, long before Shodan, and drew up plans for a game that was cutting edge in huge new technical ways and colonized your imagination with possibility. In avoiding risk, something you see in the arc from System Shock to System Shock 2 to Bioshock to even Deus Ex Human Revolution, we see a genre that largely gave up on looking for new ideas years ago, focusing on intense but superficial experiences that leave your mind as soon as they stop rendering onto your screen. This is true of a lot of modern gaming as well. So many games rely on a foundation designed by others that make truly new ideas a financial risk. The immersive sim kitchen may be a technical impossibility right now, but it's also not the only idea of its kind that we avoid for the sake of pleasing the same crowds year in and year out for precisely the reasons we already understand. Graphics are not going to get substantially better going forward, and they don't need to be. There is so much potential in the gameplay space that no one is mining, that when one indie game finally strikes some innovative design gold, everyone comes and copies it to oblivion. System Shock, a game that is nearly three decades old and not celebrated nearly as much as its sequels, serves as a kind of evolutionary dead end that didn't need to go out like that. Earlier this year I dreamt on coasting directly into a Bioshock review or a Bioshock series review and after playing these games that's still a possibility. But now that I've made it so far into this review, what I really want to do is tell you to play the System Shock Enhanced Edition, scale its learning cliff and experience the game that has informed virtually every single first person shooter role-playing game, and immersive sim in modern times. I want you to truly feel rewarded in the experience of enjoying this jewel and its vastly underrated villain, the best in gaming. And when you're done with that, go play the sequel and join the queue wondering how these new franchise extensions will honor and extend the series. It's my dream that someday we'll get a new System Shock game or really any other game that dares to not just cash in on franchise comfort and familiarity, but to push the envelope hard, leaving gamers with no choice but to hold space in their brain for it long after they've taken their hands off the controls. Sleek, fast, revolutionary. Who knows what wonders await our crews in the bosom of the cosmos. All we do know is that it's a great day for mankind. Hey reviewers, how was that? Three hours, just about, of System Shock series madness. Yes, I am as surprised as you that I would have the opinions about this series that I wound up having. Uh, it was pretty nuts. And uh, if you've made it this far, obviously, don't forget to hit the like and the subscribe. Hit them. Come on. It's, uh, it's a big thing for me coming at the end of the year that it's been a year since I was cramming together the five hour thief series review it's been an entire year it feels like just every christmas i'm just gonna have one big video uh to put together so uh, i'm at an interesting point now 
in deciding the next couple reviews. And we'll be seeing those soon, and you guys have been helping me out with that selection process. There's so many to pick from, and it's like, well, what video is going to grow the channel? Who knows? Uh, I'm recording this a day or two before I record the Q&A, so I might be covering the same grounds. But anyway, thank you for watching. Shodan, bless you. This wonderful January, I guess now. Uh, this will probably be, I hope it's out by the year anniversary of the Thief series review. That'd be great great if it outperformed the Thieves series review. That's kind of like the high watermark. Or I guess even Deus Ex. Deus Ex did a little bit better and then kind of fall. Anyway, thank you so much. And I thank my Patreon supporters over here who've really helped me out this year uh, and continue to support the channel. And any more that show up in the next bit, hey, that'd be cool too. I'd love to do more of these more often. Um, and get some more reviews out because I've got plenty of things I'd love to cover. I'd love to cover Mass Effect. I'd love to cover uh, Indigo Prophecy would love to cover XYZ I've got so many that I want to do and it's with your support that I'm able to do that uh, I am not stretching this out just to hit the 3 hour limit I swear to god <laughs> how many time? we don't even have time ah we're only 2 minutes in whatever anyway thank you and uh, take care like subscribe share this on every platform you can including reddit and Instagram, I'm sure they love three hour videos. I'm just rambling. Okay, thank you. Have a good one. Bye bye.